new album, her ninth. It's called Trust Fall. It's fantastic. We'll tell you more about that. Also, Mariska Hargitay spilled the beans on all things you want to know about Law & Order SVU. Hey, the guys showed up too. Jabari Banks teased what to expect from Bel Air season two. And Jonathan Majors came by to talk about his upcoming roles in Creed, which I'm dying to see, and Ant-Man. He's a very busy guy. We have a jam-packed show, so let's get right to it. So when Pink stops by, it's guaranteed that she's going to get the party started. From songs like So What to Raise Your Glass, Pink has taken the charts by storm for over two decades, all while staying very true to her unique identity. Well, she's back with her latest album, her ninth. It's called Trust Fall. And she pinkified Studio 1A in honor of her new music. Take a look. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you believe you haven't been here since 2012? No, and I'm usually outside, right? I know. And she just said, look at us. We're all grown up. We're so grown what up. What happened we have to nice us? Chairs and <laughs> thanks to you. Flowers. Uh, I know. It's just for you. How does it feel to be in this moment and have this record out? You said this is uh, the best one you've ever done. I mean, uh, maybe. I think one of them. For sh Yes, I do. I think yeah. that. Um, it feels crazy that it's nine. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's, I'm in New York with my kids and it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. I feel really good. What I feel the best about is the, is having a platform where people can just talk right to you yeah. and tell you what's resonating with them. Mm. And that lyric out there, Turbulence, almost made me cry. I'll tell you what, that's my favorite song off the record. Turbulence. And I was going to ask you about it, but I saw, met Becca <laughs> out there who survived cancer, and she referenced yeah. Turbulence. Turbulence is a track off the record yep. that, for me, for somebody who's dealt with mental health issues, I heard that song for the first time, and you have that whole lyric about, you're alive, that means you're committed to survive. Mm. Yep. You know, the panic may be temporary, but I'm permanent. I mean, yep. what has the reaction been to that song in particular? Everybody gets it, and that kind of makes me sad and happy all at the same time. Um, it's sort of, I don't, I hate telling people what a song is about, because it's whatever it's about for you, but for me, it's just sort of speaking to anxiety and almost walking my daughter through it down that road. And my favorite line is, even when you say you can't, I will watch you dance through this turbulence. Mm. Right. Yeah. It was a turbulent time that you wrote this record. Yeah. The, the pandemic. Yep. You and your family both really sick yep. for a time, and yep. you lost your father, who yeah. meant so much to you. Yeah. He was such a big part of you a, doing this. Absolutely, absolutely. I got to live out his dream. <laughs> Tell everybody about Jim Moore, your dad. It was a vet. Jimbo. I mean, this was a. It was awesome growing up as his daughter because growing up as the daughter of a veteran is it's just so. To see grown men hug and cry, and we were doing car washes every weekend, and every Thanksgiving was feeding women and children from shelters and homeless and and they would have three-day campouts every year called lz friendship and uh, you know free-range kids these kids today <laughs> they don't know about that kind of stuff but i was like the beer runner um i remember having low and brow ones okay we don't need to get into that <laughs> it's all coming back to you it's going in a different direction Actually, we have a, someone wanted to send you, a, a friend of your dad's wanted to send oh, you a fellow guys are veteran. Oh, you to kill me well, this morning. Well, let's just roll it. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. It's Aww. Tom, your dad's veteran brother. Tom Frame. We all love and miss him. Yeah. And congratulations on your new album. Aw. I love when I get there. Aww. He would be so proud of you. Mm. Love you. I love you, too. That's your dad's guitar in that? I think yep. they told me. Yep. Did he write I've Seen the Rain in that? It's a song your dad wrote in He did. He wrote that. Uh, I grew up with Tom Frame. It's so mm. crazy. Um, God, he wrote that. He started it in Vietnam and uh, finished it after. And we put it on one of my albums, and he got to perform it with me in New York. And he could finger pick. He could mm. play the guitar. He was in a quartet in the Air Force. Right. He was the... He was that voice. Oh, wow, the high yeah. range. Yeah. When I Get There is the first track on the record that's yeah. just so simple. Yeah. And it's about the idea. Is that so I would like a love letter to your dad? That's what's beautiful about it is its simplicity. And yeah. it's a love letter to my dad. And, I, you know, we lost our dear, dear friend, Patricia, who went as Trish, eight months later. So it's just, it's a nice idea to think, I hope you're there. Mm. You know, I hope you're somewhere awesome. Yeah. Well, you are going to tour. Yes. And are you going to do all those acrobatics? I sure am. Crazy lady crazy. that you always do. When you go and see Tina Turner and she's 69 years old in Louboutins running all around that <laughs> stage, sounding better than you ever have and dancing harder, 
You have no excuse. I'm going to be 90 in a tutu. Tinkerbell flying through the air. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? It's so much fun. So two, a couple tours. Do something this summer and then Trust Falls start in yep. the fall. Yep. Yep. A bunch of North American stadiums for that. Yeah. Are the kids going to come with? Take the kids out? You know, absolutely. Yeah. Willow has a job on tour. We just had to go over minimum wage. And <laughs> it's different state to state. And she, I said, you know, it's about twenty two fifty a show, depending on uh, how long I go. If I run over. And she goes, I'll, I'll take 20. It's easier math. I'm like, that's not how you negotiate for yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you'll take 25. <laughs> so it's easier math. Exactly. There you, you go. Get Jameson to negotiate for her. I bet you get a like, good deal. I just want a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love you, kid. Uh, well, we're so happy to have you here. Thanks. The record's really great. Wish Thank we had more time you. to talk about Thank it. You. It's, your, it's your best work. Gotta love our buddy Pink. So good. If you get a chance to check her out in concert, too, do that. You can stream Trustfall now wherever you get your music. It's fantastic. Now to another rock star, none other than Olivia Benson herself. That's Mariska Hargitay, the star of Law & Order SVU. Stop by Studio 1A to catch us up on everything we need to know about the current season. You know what I read this morning? That Olivia Benson is the longest running character in television history. That's it's, incredible. It's crazy. I'm still downloading all of it. I mean, wh why do you think it has such staying power? People love this show. I think that it is a smart show, a respectful show, deals with such um, tender issues that so many people deal with, and uh, it deals with them respectfully and honoring, and everyone wants to be seen, and I think the culture is ready to look at something and deal with something that they uh, historically haven't been ready to deal with, and I think the setup of the show with Olivia being the maternal figure and Elliot being, you know, the paternal figure, did I say maternal and paternal figure, I think was sort of the perfect archetype in that um, um, victims could come forward and feel safe and seen and fought for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, um, in addition to being the longest running character, you're also an executive producer of the series yeah. and a director of the series. And we actually have a sneak peek of tonight's new episode. Let's, let's roll a clip. Mr. Humphreys, how you doing? I'm Captain Benson. I never forget a gorgeous face. <laughs> or an hourglass figure. Well, uh, the cafeteria downstairs may have just added a few extra minutes to it. I'm sorry. You direct oh, this episode, I... it's an, and it's an unusual one. It's not, you, you, you took some kind of artistic risks, didn't you? Yeah. With some flashbacks. I don't want to give too much away, but. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'll say is that our uh, showrunner, David Graziano and Julie Martin, wrote one of the most beautiful episodes I think I've I've really ever read. And it's a bit of a departure from what we usually do. And there are a whole lot of surprises in it. And I was so deeply honored because that they trusted me with this material. And people will see why tonight. It is different. It is different. And um, I have to say, I was so excited and you know every time you direct I have such reverence and respect for the role of directing and I'm always terrified and yet this time because I hadn't directed in three years it was so fun to to see what I had learned just mm. from being on set for that long and then I got the good good fortune and the blessing and the privilege and and just the honor to work with um, Bradley Whitford oh yeah who is one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with and then also Nancy, Nancy Travis, Travis came yes. and and my co-stars came to play in such a beautiful way and um, Octavio you know one of the new characters on SVU tonight is so brilliant in this as is Ice-T and the new kids and I just love working with Peter Scanavino and there's such an effortlessness and um, it was one of the most uh, joyous, uh, creative mm. highlights of my time at SVU. I mean, it is. Truly. You bring so much to it now. I mm. mean, having played the character, but now bringing that other side behind yeah. the scenes. You mentioned Ice-T, or shall we say, I see. As we learned that you called him because he, you spoke at his um, Hollywood star ceremony, the walk. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Why that can't 
I, why, what is that called? Why I'm having the high, like a Hollywood speech. Walk of Fame. Thank you. I know and why. it's so funny because I wasn't planning. You know, I'd written this beautiful speech, and I was like, how am I going to honor him? How am I going to honor him, this, you know, titan in the business? And then that just came up because my relationship <laughs> with him is so cozy. And what you said about him was beautiful. It was oh. a beautiful speech, but Icy is a very cute nickname. Well, I what call him call Icy. <laughs> Marishki? <laughs> You know, we all have a lot of nicknames for each other. I know. Oh, you're not going to tell me, are No, you? no, I'm not. Okay. But um, he, I'm the only one that's allowed to call him Icy. Oh. And so. I'm it, glad you told me that because if I tried it next oh, time don't, he's here. Oh, don't, don't, no. don't. Mm -hmm. Not good. He's actually the sweetest man alive. Oh. And I, the kindest and the most gentle. And, you know, Richard Belzer passed mm. and you also wrote a lovely tribute to him. And he was just, I mean, what a heart and soul part of the show for a long, long time. Yeah. What a heart and soul. That was, um, he was family. Yeah. And taught me um, so much about uh, taking risks and creativity and um, trust. And he brought so much joy to the set. And boy, did this man love children. He was, you know, this acerbic, quick witted, brilliant <laughs> mind. And yet he would melt in the sight of a child. Oh. He was just such a beautiful um, and complex and. Uh, it was such a privilege to know him. Well, you are just so well spoken. I, I mean, like, we speak at some. If I, I please speak at my funeral, would you? Oh, okay. Is that too morbid? <laughs> no, no, I'd be honored. Okay, good. You're like, <laughs> this is taking a weird turn. Okay, before I let you go, I can't. Not you know what ask I say you. about you? Hold what? on, I'm just gonna say it. What? Badass. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. I think you are such a badass, and I have such respect for you, and I want to say that. Oh my gosh. Yes, and you know when and why I think that, but so do a lot of people, oh. and the way you are and oh the way you gosh. carry yourself, I want, I want to say that. You're so kind, and thank you. That's true. Now and I don't know what to do. To no one. Oh what? my God! Yeah, it, that's right. That's right, my queen. All right, I was going to ask you about the tell me, tell and me. stapler. Just all right. Just tell us real quick. Do they do it or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'll just tell you right yeah, now. Yeah, okay. She's not um, going to tell All you need to know is Benson and Stick. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Benson and Stabler love each other deeply. How deeply? <laughs> just... <laughs> She just, just said that. No, there, there, it's right there. There it is. There it is. It's so deep. I know, and we love it. Yes. And we just love wondering. And you know, the show is going. probably only going to go another 23 years. Yeah. So I think we should <laughs> just wait and see. Exactly. You got to keep the suspense. Yes. Keep it alive. Mariska, what a pleasure and oh. unexpected. You're such a sweetheart. Wow. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank I you mean for it. being here. Being a, you're a sister. I know that. Also, always great to hear from Mariska. NBC's Law & Order SVU airs Thursdays on NBC. And coming up, we're going to hear from Jabari Banks about the season two of Peacock's Bel Air. Welcome back after a very successful first season. Bel Air is back now for season two action. And this time around, Jabari Banks' character, Will, experiences quite the challenge when someone new enters his world, all while he navigates the ebbs and flows of life on the West Coast. Jabari was nice enough to swing by our third hour to give us the entire scoop. Take a look. 
So a little more than a year ago, our next guest made one of his first live TV appearances here on the third hour I just today. Remember, well, we were like, oh my I God, know, this we kid so is a star. <laughs> it was just everything with his energy. Jabari Banks was just kicking off his career at the time as the star of Peacock's hit drama Bel Air. It puts a groundbreaking spin on the classic, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Now Jabari is back for round two yes. this season. He's going to try to smooth things over with Lisa. Watch okay. this. Hey, girl, hey. Hey, how's it going? Good. Um, you think we could find a second to talk about our situation? I just don't like how we've been avoiding the whole issue between us. Well, I've been trying to give you your space since you're going through a lot. But, um, yeah, an actual conversation would be cool. Cool. Jabari is back. Welcome back. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you guys for having me. Are you kidding? This Thank is you. great. First of all, this show was a staple in my house. So <laughs> it's an honor to be here. Happy to hear that. Thank you. Happy Don't to watch too here. much television. It's not good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I can't see now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. right. uh, season one was a huge hit. Oh my gosh. Tell us where season two picks up. Right. So season two picks up. Will is outside of the gates of Bel Air and he's living with Jazz in South LA. Right? And he's navigating, trying to find his freedom, and trying to reconnect mm. with his family. And so it's a whole journey for season two. Mm. I'm super excited for people to check it out. Cannot wait. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got all these great stars in it. I mean, you've got Saweetie in there. Uh, you got Tatiana Ali reprising her original role. Yeah. Uh, so, so what was it like having Tatiana back on this? Oh, That's it was cool. so meta. It was so meta. It was yeah. almost surreal. Like, she yeah. was crying the whole time. Wow. Really? Because, you know, she grew up on The Fresh Prince yeah. of Bel-Air. Yeah. And so to see Akira Akbar, like, take on this role of Ashley, right, it was like, a, a mirror of sorts, and so it was mm -hmm. super surreal for her. But she was such a joy, such a sweetheart, and I can't wait for people to see I her. I love it. I could yeah. write a paper about how amazing the season two is and what you guys have been able to do with the original concept of the show. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, speaking of the original class, Will Smith is an executive producer mm -hmm. um, of Bel Air, one of the executive producers, and I read that he gave you some good advice as you started season two. What oh, yeah. Say? For sure. Well, well, in, in, in between season one and season two, I kind of had a, a, a midlife crisis, a mid-season crisis. Okay. Mm -hmm. In between season crisis, and so I was reading the book of The Alchemist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot of great talks um, just about life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I was allowed to apply that to the role for season two. Is it tough to approach season two when season one was, listen, drop the mic. Like, everybody's ready now. Yeah. Right. Before, before we didn't know what to expect. Now yeah. we come, like... Exactly. Well, you know... It's, it's something about expectations. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so I kind of had to throw that out the window okay. and approach season two, how we approach season one from such a pure, you know what I mean, yep. uh, standpoint. And so that's kind of how we attacked that's it. good. Yeah. Um, are your parents watching right now? They are. They yeah. are. <laughs> I know. I, Hello. Your, your parents are, are huge in this whole yeah. experience you've been going through. It was your mm -hmm. dad we talked about when you were here the first time that actually told you there was a casting for this. Right. What do they think now going into season two and all your success? I mean, they're just over the moon. They're over yeah. the moon and I'm so happy that that um I could give them this opportunity to kind of experience all of their hard work mm -hmm. you know what I mean that they put into me so uh, it's a blessing yeah. really. it is a blessing yeah. Jabari I wanted to ask you because last time you were here I saw that you said you know everybody asked where do you want to be in 10 years and you said oh, you wanted yeah. to have your own clothing line yeah. uh, you want to work on some music you wanted to open an amusement park yeah. <laughs> right. how are yeah. you doing on, on all that um, um I'm a little bit closer to the the first two okay. <laughs> right but I'm still working on that me and Al we're gonna have a meeting after this all I right love it. there you go I love it. <laughs> The roller coaster is going to be slammed. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we work on the Universal Studio lot, so I've been studying up and kind of just going. I love it. Right. You call it the roller coaster. <laughs> the roller coaster. Hey, no, we're not with Jabari here. So, okay, so you talked about there's some folks you would like to play going forward, like in, in feature films. Anybody Ooh. come to mind? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would love to play uh, Sam Cooke. Oh, oh wow. I can see that. He has oh, a great yeah. body oh, look of work. At this. Look at I can see it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the music and the activism. Mm -hmm. ah, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? This is we. You know, we know people around here. People listen, so maybe they'll, we'll put that in the universe. Yeah. Look at that side by side. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. I how see about it. That? Done. You see oh. it? It's good yeah. stuff. Okay. <laughs> and bring me to the amusement park, please. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Can't wait to see how season two unfolds. Bel Air is streaming now on Peacock. Coming up, we're going to hear from Jonathan Majors about two of his upcoming projects.
And we're back after rising through fame through his roles in The Harder They Fall and Lovecraft Country. Jonathan Majors is making his mark majorly. Last year, he even hosted Saturday Night Live alongside musical guest Taylor Swift, an event for the ages. Now he's back with his latest projects as he joins the Ant-Man and Creed franchises. Have you seen this yet? We all have. <laughs> he also recently graced the cover of Ebony Magazine, and we are so happy that he's here with us now. Jonathan Major! <laughs> Wait, you still look like that one. <laughs> never, never, Hello, never mind. how never are mind. you? How are you? <laughs> Is it weird to walk past the cover of I you know. on a magazine? Right? Uh, <laughs> Not really. I'm like... Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Especially when it's that big. What's up, Especially with roses and... Uh... Yeah, it's deep. There you go. Um, uh, Welcome. We, yeah, we're so happy you're here. I, I, I sort of hope you don't watch this show because <laughs> Hoda and I have spent a lot of time drooling... Analyzing that cover. Analyzing <laughs> the, the cover of that magazine. Uh -oh. um, what, when somebody calls to ask you to do something like that, what do you do to get ready for it? What do I do? Uh, Nothing. Show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be nice. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. You don't have to do some extra crunches or anything, but no, you stay no, ready, it's, don't it's you? It's a lifestyle at oh, this point. Oh, okay. You know, you just kind of just go after it and, and, you know, live healthy and, yeah, do your best. When this hit my Instagram feed, I thought maybe I was the first to see it, but clearly not because all of a sudden my phone was like, bzz, 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 bzz. <laughs> yeah. I have friends over at Ebony and they were like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you know when you were doing it that it was going to be this big of a groundswell? No, nothing wrong with causing a ruckus. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. By I the way, that. you say that there's nothing wrong with causing a ruckus. Is that sort of your motto for your career, too, or no? Yeah, I, I kind of keep it cool, and then there's a time for everything, you know, and sometimes it's time to just, you know, make some noise. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So it's time, sometimes it's time to make a ruckus, and I also read that you say sometimes it's good to have a little swagger. So I guess swagger is subjective, but... Well, I was but, just yeah. about to say, how do yeah. you teach swagger? Like, I've got two boys, and I feel like sometimes, especially when you're in the middle school age, yeah. Yeah. it's an awkward phase, it's kind of hard. Did it's you deep. always feel that or no? It's deep. Swagger's an interesting thing because uh, it can't really be taught, and it's not what you think it is. If you what? try to do what's swaggy, you're going to miss it. Ooh. You're going to miss it. Swaggy is just behind swagger. Mm. You know what I mean? How do you it, teach it's that? Just, you are, so you can't teach you it. Can't you teach can't it. teach it. But now, yeah. when, when you were... Because it's already there. It's part of who you are, It's like right? the force. It was yeah. there all along. It's within you. I yeah. No, but here's my question. When you were growing up, is it true that somebody said to you, you don't have it? Not even growing up. I was a grown man when they said <laughs> And what, and so how do you... father. Yeah. How do you listen to... Your, <laughs> you had a child. Yeah. How do you listen to yourself and mm. know that, like, who you are is enough and you don't need other people to define who you are to, to make you cool? You know, my mother told me that the whole time. Mm. I had a drama teacher said, you know, you are enough. But you get to a point where it's like you have no other choice. When the stakes get high enough, you got to pick a team, you know, and it's best to double down on yourself. You, you know, know what? I'm happy you're talking about that because I think a lot of people will see celebrities and they just assume you've always been this way, right? But this has been a journey. And now this is your season, my friend. We've got Creed. We love Michael B. Jordan. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to see both of y'all fight. Well, it's deep. Uh, uh, Mike and I, uh, Michael B. Jordan and I uh, have become close, close friends, and uh, the fight is real. Okay, well, we have to take a look, because this has been a very hard movie to get a screener for, but <laughs> we have a quick okay. clip from Creed 3. Take okay. a look. I was the best, though. Yeah, you were. I was, bro. But I never got a chance to prove that. Look, all I'm saying, bro, if, if Apollo Creed take a chance on some underdog. Why can't you? What? <laughs> Wait, so this is the first time you're seeing this? Yeah, my, yeah, I've, I've not seen the movie. You what? know, and so that's the most of that clip I've ever seen. I mean, I know the scene, obviously, but I've never... Yeah. Why, now, why haven't y'all seen it yet? Because it's... Well, people have seen it. Yeah. You know, some folks have seen it, but I just... Do you not uh, want to look right now? I, I, I never really... I don't have that desire. Even when it's you out? You don't watch your, your no, own work. No, 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 no. I wouldn't look at the Ebony cover if I didn't <laughs> bang, you know, bang, my, bang my phone every eight minutes. So was it hard to train for this role? Listen, Michael B. Jordan is in, you know, it goes without saying. He's a man, yeah. Right. And so are you. So did you have to train? I mean, what did you have to do to get ready to step into that, that ring? First thing Mike said to me, or one of the first things he said was, I want two gladiators in the ring, mm -hmm. you know? And as we know, Mike also directed this film. Yeah. And so I take direction from my director, like gospel. Mm -hmm. And that means something because I'm a pastor. So you say it to me, I go, 
uh, okay, you sure? You know, uh, and so we went for it, you know, and so uh, three day workouts, training, living a boxing lifestyle, you know, for, I think I had that for a, a year and a half. Wow. You know? Yeah, to the point that my boxing coach said at one point, uh, yeah, let's, we gotta cut the cardio. Really? Like, like it's, it's, it's getting too real, you know, like wow. let's cut the cardio, you know. So when you is the last time on. you had a piece of pizza? Oh, yesterday. Oh, Me and Mike okay. actually had a piece of pizza yesterday. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> So yeah, he's not re okay, he's so not he's refraining from he's back. Yeah, eating. Yeah. He's just yeah. working out. Okay, now, yeah. we, but so you just said your mom was a pastor. Is that right? She is. She is a pastor. You are still right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, she and, is. And so you said that she was sort of always believed in you and saw something in yeah. you. Did you know you wanted to act from a really young age? Well, I've been acting a, a, a crazy fool, you know, my whole life. Well, now and, you get paid uh, for it. And now we get paid. For yeah. It, you know, uh, yeah, it's always been my. Uh, even if, it was, even if it wasn't my ambition, in the times in which it wasn't my ambition, it was always my drive. Mm. I was always pulled towards it, um, always felt the need to do it. Um, and uh, stuck, it's the one thing that stuck with me. It's mm. probably the only thing in my life that has stuck with me outside of my kid. Looking forward to seeing Jonathan in his next upcoming flicks. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania is out now, and Creed 3 will come out on March 3rd. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us today. From Pink to Jabari and everywhere in between, that was a lot of fun. It was quite the week here in Studio 1A. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time right here on Popstar Plus. Let's talk about the fact that it's Super Food Friday. So you're going to see what we did. Uh, today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer cooking up a cozy dish to beat the cold weather. It's taco soup. Hey, hey Joy. Let's talk about it. Okay, so let's, let's get step. What's a, let's get started. What's the first step? It was kind of like chili with a twist. Yes, I love this so much. I hope you guys are going to love it. So uh, basically what we're doing is we're taking the beloved taco mm -hmm. and we're transforming it into a slurpable soup with all of those wonderful Tex-Mex flavors that we love and we crave. And the best part is it comes together in about 30 minutes, maybe even less, oh. in one pot, which I can really appreciate oh, from the cleanup so afterwards. So how do we get started? Yeah. Okay, so here what I have is one pound of lean ground turkey meat that I added into the pot together with one diced onion. So you could cook these things together and just take a wooden spoon and as it cooks, you're going to chop it up. It takes about seven to nine minutes. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the onion is going to infuse a lot of flavor into the meat, but I love the fact that you can cook them together. And for people that don't want turkey meat, you can swap in beef. You can even swap in cooked about two or three cups of lentils. Oh. So you can make it vegetarian, you could really make it your own. So now we basically just build the soup. So all of those things that we love in tacos, I'm having 
adding in two cans of rinsed drained black beans. So you know now we're adding a lot of plant-based protein mm -hmm. and fiber. I'm also adding in for a pop of color and more fiber, a can of rinsed and drained corn. And then this is going to be two cups of, well, I'm already up to the taco seasoning, but I added in some quartered cherry or grape tomatoes. And you could, if you if you don't want to deal with slicing, you could always toss in a can of those um, diced fire roasted tomatoes. Mm. And I would say go ahead and throw the liquid in also because sure. it's only going to bolden up that broth. And now when it comes to the taco seasoning, you have two options. You could just go to the store, take the easy way out, yep. and add in whatever's on sale a taco oh, yeah. seasoning packet. If you want to go that extra mile, I'm going to show everybody. I'll put it on today.com, and I'll also show you on um, Instagram and Facebook how to make the easiest do-it-yourself taco seasoning blend. So it's just chili powder, cumin, salt, pepper. This is paprika. You can go sweet. You could go smoky. Garlic, onion powder, red pepper flakes, and oregano. And the cool thing about this is you know exactly what's in it, sure. and then you got a whole stash in your pantry. That's true. Yeah, and you can adjust the salt the if salt. you want. Or Exactly. Yeah. So speaking of salt, when it comes to the broth, so you mix all of this together, mm -hmm. and then you're going to add in four cups of a reduced sodium, either chicken broth, beef broth, or vegetable broth. And the reason I like to do a reduced sodium is because you can always add more in at the end, sure. but you can't take the sodium out. And so this, this is going on in there. And I just woo, mix mix this whole thing up, and then it it was it was four cups, and then you're gonna mix this thing up, and you just let it simmer. So one thing I will tell you is mm -hmm. I really like an intense Tex-Mex flavor. So what I would do is you put tequila. <laughs> Al, I've never tried that, but this would probably go really well with a margarita. And now I add a second taco oh, seasoning wow. packet in there. Yeah. So everybody can adjust to their own taste buds. And Boy, I'm going to bring you over to my... Yes, 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 yes. Come with me over to my island, and we're going to add some special toppings. So was, uh, my favorite part is the camera switch. That's right. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So so here I have it in the bowl. You can see how gorgeous so this is. So it's kind of cooked down a bit. Yes. And it, honestly, Al, it only takes about five minutes to simmer the whole thing. Look how mm -hmm. action-packed this is. Can you put I together? Mean, can you put one together real quickly, Joy? Yes. So here I have with my ladle. I'm going to spoon it in here. And like uh -huh. you said earlier, you really are combining the flavors of a taco together with a chili. It's a uh -huh. little, it's soupier than a chili. Uh -huh. Now, I'm going to add on some Mexican cheese. Yeah. I have some avocado. Oh, yeah. I have some jalapenos. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the spice, take the seeds out of the jalapenos for sure. And here's okay. one and last you thing you can the do. Taco, the taco shells Here on we top. go. There I'm going to make a little go. bit of a mess. Right. Ian's going to cringe. <laughs> ah, there you go. Look at the muscles like steel. Joy, <laughs> it's always good to see you. Thanks Thank so you, much. Joy. Perfect Thanks, for this Joy. weekend. Love you guys. We love you mm. too. For more recipes like this, head to today.com slash food. You can always count on Today Nutritionist and our pal, Joy Bauer, to whip up something healthy and delicious. Joy, a lot of people, we didn't get a real reset, so we're res re resetting today. So what do you have for us today? I am so crazy excited to show you how to make this meal. I think it's going to be on repeat in both of your homes, and it's super kid-friendly. Okay. So this is a turkey bolognese. Mm. It's obviously it's healthified. It's packed with protein, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. But I'm telling you the best part, it is a one-pot wonder. And I think you're going to be amazed how easy this thing comes together. Okay, and you've decided so, to swap beef for turkey. Is that because it's a little leaner? Starting. That's what you're supposed to do? That's right. Yeah. So here, what this is a pound of lean ground turkey. And when you shop for it at the store, look for turkey that is between 90 and 94% lean, because it's still going to be flavorful and juicy. If you get up to the 99% lean, it's too dry. So between 90 mm, and 94%. 94. After this was already cooked, what I've done is I threw in, you can see here all the vegetables. I have diced celery, red bell pepper, onion, and carrots. And I saute it with the meat. Ah. But because I want to save a little bit of time, because I'm going to nail this thing before we close the spot. Okay. I pre-sauteed all of the yummy vegetables. And now we basically have a nutrition party in this pot. Okay. We now take 
This is a 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes. Oh, wow. One cup of broth, whatever you have in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take another easy way out. And instead of dealing with separate seasonings, I have here just five teaspoons of Italian seasoning. So this adds mm, oregano mm -hmm. and basil and thyme. Yeah. And then I'm gonna stir this whole thing up. I'm going to put it on the stove, let it cook for about 25 minutes covered. Can you I ask, uncover it. Can I ask one question, Joy, shift. just to be clear? Yeah. So the turkey was already cooked and you uh, if you were just starting from scratch, you'd put in the raw turkey and all the veggies at together the at the same time and saute. No, I, I, I'm so glad you asked that. No, so first what I do is I, in stages, I cook the ground turkey first By and itself. it takes about six minutes, right? And I'm just sort of chopping it up. When the ground turkey is cooked and there's no more pink, then I throw in the veggies. Oh. We're building, and it's another six to eight minutes. Okay. And then you you throw Ooh, in everything else that. and look at this. That looks like a sloppy and joe. <laughs> Mm. So, you know, it's it. interesting that you say that, Hoda, because I actually like to put it on toasted English muffins Ooh. or in soft, like, Portuguese buns. Oh, my goodness. So now I'm going to take this pasta. Now, yes, what is you this can pasta? Eat whole, yeah. This is a whole grain pasta. Yeah. And for people that are sensitive to cutting back on carbs, you can use zoodles, which are zucchini noodles, or you can also do spaghetti squash. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, I have over here some parm because you guys know everything's better with a little oh, bit of yes. parm. Oh, oh, yeah. Look at that. Mm -hmm. By Is the way, this amazing? I've seen some chickpea, like some other kind of flour pasta. Are those better for you? That's what this is, actually. Oh. So I said it was a whole grain, but if you opened up my cabinet, I have true whole grain, which is just 100% whole wheat. But I also have so many different brands of, like, chickpea or bean or lentil pasta. I would suggest people experiment around. It has a little bit more protein and it has a little bit more fiber. It really depends mm. on what you prefer in terms of your taste. One other thing I'm going to do as soon as we um, shut down the segment, yeah. I'm going to try to make a bolognese burrito. Oh, I'll yes. let you know how it works out. I'm going to put it in a wrap. Yes, with a yes. lot of cheese on it. We love a bolognese then... burrito. Yes. Joy, yes. Joy, yes. we miss you. We miss you. Um, it's good to see you, though. To get this mm -hmm. recipe, head to today.com slash food. Mm -hmm. Delicious. It is Cheat Day Friday, and today nutritionist Joy Bauer is putting her spin on a crispy chicken sandwich. Mm. Take it away, Guys, Joy. I am <laughs> so jazzed about this copycat chicken sandwich. It mimics the famed fast food version that we love, but for fewer calories, less fat, and more protein and fiber. It is the ultimate winner winner chicken dinner. We start with two skinless breasts, and I sandwich it between either parchment paper or wax paper, and we're gonna pound them thin. We want the width to be no wider than about half an inch. And I love that you get a mini workout too. Now I have two gigantic pieces of chicken breast. And I'm gonna slice these pieces in half because we're gonna make four servings. 
Next, you can take a bag or a bowl and place your chicken pieces right inside. And we're gonna marinate it with something surprising. One cup of pickle juice. That's right, we're using pickle juice. Now, your chicken is not gonna taste like pickle juice, but the pickle juice is going to tenderize it and it's gonna make it nice and juicy. Then you're gonna pop this in the fridge and let it marinate from 30 minutes until overnight. And now we're gonna set up our two-step dredging bowls. So here I have two tablespoons of mayonnaise and I'm gonna mix that with one egg. It's almost making like a glue. Okay, and now for the yummy breading. I'm starting with one cup of breadcrumbs, but you can also use flour. And to season them up, I have garlic powder, onion powder, paprika, a little bit of salt and pepper. Whisk this up. You wanna make sure all of your seasonings are evenly distributed. Take each piece of chicken and shake off the excess pickle juice and dunk it in the egg mayo mixture, get it nice and coated, shake off the excess, and then douse it in all of the breadcrumbs. You really wanna pat it down and then place it right on your baking sheet. I missed the top with a little oil spray, and then I like to sprinkle a bit of kosher salt right over the top. Now I'll place them in the oven, set at 450 on the middle rack for about 20 minutes. And while the chicken is cooking, we're gonna make the sauce. So we're starting with a quarter cup of light mayonnaise, adding in two tablespoons of your favorite barbecue sauce, a tablespoon of yellow mustard, and one teaspoon of lemon juice. Just gonna mix this up. If you do like it a little bit sweeter, you can go ahead and you can add in honey. And here is our crispy chicken. And now we're going to build our sandwich. I'm starting with pickles, lettuce, tomatoes, our chicken, look at that piece. And of course, our special creamy, dreamy tangy sauce. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness, this is a chicken sandwich. And you didn't even have to leave the house. Mm, looks really good. Yeah, All right, for these recipes and more, you can head to today.com slash food. We are chasing away the winter chill with two warm and cozy recipes. Today nutritionist Joy Bowers here, joining us with a corn chowder and a spiced chai tea. Mm, good let's morning, start cooking. Joy. Good morning. Oh, my people. Hey, guys. So today is all about warming the bones with okay. healthy foods and beverages. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're going to make is, like you mentioned, a cozy, creamy corn chowder. And I'm telling you, this is scrumptiously slurpable. Mm. I'm going to take you over to my stove. Okay. So here um, I have what I'm calling my nutrition confetti. All I've done is I sauteed some carrots, celery, and onions. It kind of looks like confetti, doesn't Carrot, it? Celery, onions. Okay. okay. Um, and, and now we build the soup. It's as easy as that. Because corn is not in season, I'm taking advantage of canned corn actually for a few reasons. One is because I get to use it. You notice I didn't drain it. The juice, I, yeah. I'm using the flavorful broth that normally oh. we just discard. Mm -hmm. I'm putting two cans in there. Then I'm putting in a full um, four cups of either a vegetable broth or a chicken broth. What did and you use there? I would, I'm using, uh, this is a chicken broth and I'm using a reduced sodium because I'm controlling the salt. Okay. So there we have that. And then just a little bit of cayenne because it really does give it a pop of flavor. Okay. And then last, one pound of small red potatoes. I leave the skin on for extra fiber. And um, I cut them up into bite-sized pieces right. because I'm going to put a lid on this. I'm going to simmer it for about 15 minutes just until those potatoes get fork tender. Okay. I'm going to put this over here. 
And then the fun begins. I want a lot of body in this soup, so I use an immersion blender, but you can also do this in um, small batches in either a food processor or a that, regular yeah. blender. Okay. And see what I'm doing there? I'm just yeah. blending it so they get a lot of richness and body within that soup. And if anybody doesn't have a blender right. or an immersion blender, you can leave it chunky. It's totally mm -hmm. okay. It's so good. now, yeah, it's really good. You could stop right there, but we're right. not going to stop. Oh, no, so then not. to finish it off, more no texture, corn. I'm mm -hmm. adding in drained corn. So this time it's two cans of drained mm -hmm. corn. Because I saw all these and, like, whole corn kernels in there. I was wondering when they Yes. And before I actually pureed the whole thing, mm -hmm. I like to reserve some of the potatoes, so again, for them. a little bit of texture and mm -hmm. like surprises as you slurp through. That's really good. And yeah. a dash of salt. And it makes a great big batch. And I like to Very garnish simple. it with Isn't a little really bit terrific? of dill. It's really good, Joy. How about the tea, Joy? Yeah, we'll try that. that. The chai tea. This is fantastic. The chai tea. So here we go. I put four cups of water in here. I love chai because my kitchen smells so unbelievably right now. It really infuses it with such aroma. And in the four cups of water, my combination is some cinnamon sticks, ginger, a little bit of nutmeg, fennel, peppercorns, cloves, oh. and cardamom. Okay. And I give you a recipe for a balanced base, but really you can ramp up any of these spices if you like a stronger flavor. And so a as those were um, uh, simmering in here for about 15 minutes, then you put in your tea. So I have four tea bags that I added in. They've been in here for just about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Stick this over here. And now we build it. I add in three to four cups of a milk. Truth be told, I tried this with an almond milk, and it came out a little bit too thin, so I'm yeah. using a 2% reduced fat. Okay. And Maybe an oat a milk. Little I was going to ask you about oat milk, yeah. Oat milk would be fabulous. And this is a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of honey. And then I'm going to bring mm. you over mm. to my finished product. Come back with me okay. over here. I'm and sure it smells good, here, yeah. You can't I oh, strain it through a colander, mm -hmm. and here's the cool part. I feel like if you're going to be putting in so much effort, because it's much more involved than just steeping regular tea, mm -hmm. I make a great big batch, and then I stash it in the fridge, and whenever a craving calls, mm -hmm. I just warm it in the microwave, Very and you nice. have about seven cups. All right, Joy, well, thank you much. We're, we are ready for the weekend. I know, thank cozy, you. yummy, we yummy, yummy. It. Thank you, Joy. And for uh, more bye -bye, on these guys. recipes, have a great weekend. you too. too. Head to today.com slash food. Now I'm ready for a nap. Yeah. <laughs>
And we've got today nutritionist Joy Bauer here with a sweet and savory uh, take on the classic. Joy, good to see you. Good morning. Hey, guys. Today's forecast is cloudy with a huge chance of mouth-watering meatballs. And <laughs> now I've been nice. waiting to say that to you my entire life. Nicely <laughs> done. Nicely done. So let's get started. What, do we, what goes into this? So the meatballs are very standard. I'm starting with lean ground turkey meat, and I'm adding just simple stuff, an egg, a little bit of panko, and everyday seasonings, some garlic powder, some onion powder. I put in a little bit of smoky paprika because we love that in my house, mm -hmm. salt and pepper. And then you just mix this up. Again, the name of the game is a quick mix because you don't want your meatballs to get tough. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to form them into 20 to 24, I would say light and fluffy golf ball size. And if your batter gets a little bit sticky and fussy, mm -hmm. put it into the fridge or the freezer for about 15 minutes. It will firm and stiffen it up and it makes it much easier to work with. Mm -hmm. Then you just cook them in the skillet. I would say two minutes on each side undisturbed because you want to sear that outside, get it nicely browned. And then I just sort of toss them around to get all of the sides browned for five to seven minutes. Mm. But while they're cooking, I'm going to show you what really makes this recipe sing because mm. it's all about the sauce. We're making a mustard maple sauce. Oh. So here I have a little bit of light. Let me, let me, let me make sure you guys can see this. There you go. Okay. So I have some light mayo and that's going to add the creaminess. But now I'm adding Dijon mustard, okay. and the Dijon gives it a tangy zing. Because it's called mustard maple, I do have our maple syrup as a sweetener. Mm -hmm. And if anybody prefers, you can do um, honey as well. And you mix this and emulsify it until it's nice and smooth. The key is not to add the broth until everything comes together because otherwise the mayo will get a little bit clumpy. Mm. Then you, you add in your broth mm -hmm. and I'm going to take you over to the stove because I have one that's done. Let's okay. see if Ian could flip this camera, guys. <laughs> I've oh, got nice. Nice. Here I am. <laughs> so here are my meatballs and these are all complete. And I take my, my sauce over here mm -hmm. And I pour it in. Mm. Now you have two options. You just simmer this for about, I would say, 10 minutes. And if you want it nice and sort of smooth and thin, it's done. If you want it a little bit thicker, let me show you this one over yeah, here. Oh, what did you do? I added a slurry the last minute. So it was just um, one tablespoon of cornstarch mixed with a little bit of water. And mm. I mean, this, this is really thick. And then That's, what would you I, serve that with, Joy? Back over to my island, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So this is where we take it home. Now, oh, there's a wow. few different ways that you could serve it. This is standard right over penne. Sure. And for mm -hmm. this one, I, I kept it nice and thin. Yeah. These are pa pass arounds. Oh, you could put, you know, nice. as apps. Yeah. And then the but last is a sandwich. Is that is Yum. fantastic. I am. This is a meatball grilled cheese. And Yum. guys, I'm going to put this on great. Instagram. I'm obsessing over this one. Wow, that's that looks beautiful. Great. Joy, thank, thank you, you so Joy. much. Those are perfect. Mm -hmm. I love that. Going to try that this weekend. Mm -hmm. For this recipe and so much more, head to today.com slash food.
today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is putting a spin on two easy comfort food recipes. Take a look. Hey guys, today we're making scrumptious wholesome recipes using a muffin tin. First up is a mac and cheese butternut squash. So here I've roasted butternut squash cubes in the oven at 400 for about 25 minutes to get them super soft. And I just take a fork and I mash them so they're the consistency of mashed potatoes. And we're gonna start our indulgent cheese sauce. I'm adding one cup of low-fat milk, half a teaspoon onion powder, quarter teaspoon of dry mustard, and an eighth of a teaspoon of paprika. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And now you have the option to add a few drops of your favorite hot sauce. Bring this to a gentle simmer. My milk is starting to gently bubble. Turn off the heat and I'm gonna add two cups of 2% sharp cheddar. Mix it so all the cheese melts throughout. We've got all of this luscious whipped butternut squash and I'm gonna mix it right in the pot. And one tablespoon of softened butter. And now I'm adding my sauce right into my pasta. One thing, it's important to cook the pasta, your elbows, al dente because remember it's gonna cook again in the oven. I'm adding in one large beaten egg. Now we take our muffin tin and I'm gonna take half cup scoops to fill my compartments. I'm gonna top them with a little grated Parmesan cheese. And they go in the oven at 350 for about 20 minutes. I let these sit and firm for about five, 10 minutes. Pop them out with a knife or a spoon. I mean, good for you mac and cheese that you can eat with your hands. And now we're making three ingredient candy bars that'll really hit the sweet spot. Chocolate peanut butter crunch cups. Two cups of semi-sweet or dark chocolate chips, two cups of crispy rice cereal, although you can use any high fiber whole grain cereal, and a quarter cup of a creamy nut butter. I'm using peanut butter. So first I'm going to melt the chocolate, either using a double boiler or in the microwave. Now I'm just adding in quarter cup of my creamy peanut butter using semi-sweet or dark chocolate chips will provide flavanols, which helps to keep our arteries healthy, our heart, our brain healthy. Now I'm just adding in my brown rice cereal. You can see this is like a crispy puffed brown rice cereal and mix until all of the cereal is coated. And we are ready for our muffin tin and distribute the chocolatey, peanut buttery goodness. I just wet my fingers so they don't stick to the chocolate and I press down to firm the shape. And just one more thing, you can sprinkle some coarse sea salt or kosher salt. We can inspire you to spread kindness in your own life. First up, did you know this is National Play Tennis Day? And we are spotlighting two sisters making the sport more accessible to kids all around the world. Here's our Jenna Bush Hager. Love to serve. I think more kids should play tennis because it's a phenomenal one is learning how to push through obstacles. Second serve. <laughs> Historically, tennis has been deemed an elitist sport because of its very high cost to entry. Second Serve redistributes new and gently used tennis equipment all around the world. Our mission is to create greater access, inclusion, and diversity within the sport. Oh, good shot. <laughs> One of my personal favorite donations was to a young girl in Nigeria named Nana Rose. I started playing tennis since I was two years old. Nana spends four to five hours every day playing tennis. And her dedication is really an inspiration for us. Ayana and Amani tap teams across the U.S. to make this all happen. Our team has grown to over 90 different high school team members all across the U.S. We've been able to redistribute over 20,000 items in over 26 states and 14 different countries. What I was drawn to it was that it's a youth-led organization. We always have monthly meetings. Just hearing their great ideas is really great, and hopefully we can make those ideas come reality. The Shaw sisters of Second Serve have been an inspiration to me and also to our high school tennis team. It's a school of 
91% economically disadvantaged kids. Having a tennis racket gives them that sense of ownership. At first, I couldn't really hit, but now I can do like everything. Now she's competing. She's our number one player. I have seen her build a sense of confidence. I stop. Inspired to do more in their own backyard, the team started Serve Escondido. We provide free tennis lessons for under-resourced kids in our own hometown of San Diego. Good job. And in the spirit of giving back, we had a little surprise for Second Serve. Second Serve has done incredible work to make the game of tennis accessible to all. To help continue that work, Wilson is donating 100 tennis rackets and 50 pairs of youth sneakers to Second Serve. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's incredible. Oh. <laughs> Second Serve's mission of enhancing the lives of underserved children by fostering a love for tennis is inspirational and empowering to support that mission Athleta is donating 100 girls' tennis dresses to Second Serve. Thank you so oh much. My gosh. This is awesome. It's just really special to see that other people support this vision of greater access and greater diversity for all kids. When I'm on the tennis court, I've experienced that what you believe is really what you can achieve. When you're about to serve, when you're about to hit a ball, if you can visualize that ball going exactly to your target, that's often exactly what happens. Amazing sisters making a difference on and off the court. Next up, you've heard people say you can't choose your family. Well, maybe that's not entirely true. Meet a group within the LGBTQ plus community that's 32,000 family members strong and growing. And it all began with a TikTok video. Take a look. In 2018, I walked my own daughter down the aisle and just the thought of someone not having that parent at their wedding or in their life was just heartbreaking to me. That feeling motivated Dan Blevins to issue an invitation, not a dance challenge, in a TikTok video. If you are a same-sex couple that's getting married and you do not have biological parents there to support you, please let me know. What was your intended message for that? I was inspired by Sarah Cunningham and she's the founder of Free Mom Hugs. So I thought, I want to offer my services as a dad to do the same thing. There's parents that want to be there for you on your big day and will be your biggest fans. The idea, simple and straight from the heart. Dan, a hairdresser from Tennessee, offering to stand in as a dad for those in the LGBTQ plus community for weddings. I was able to walk my uh, daughter, my oldest girl down the aisle for her wedding. I, I don't think people realize until they're not there how important family is in those events. I think we tend to take our family for granted. Feeling that need of a mother figure or a father figure, even if it's virtually, means so much to a lot of people. The response immediate, the video going viral, and Dan, with the help of his friend Ray Otto, starting the group TikTok Stand In Families on Facebook. When Dan came to me with the idea, I was like, absolutely. We both knew it was needed in our community. Today, with over 32,000 members in over 60 countries, the group has become its own movement. Dan, who has kids of his own, has welcomed four more kids into his family. And Ray has added two nephews to hers. Last year, more than 80% of LGBTQ youth said COVID-19 made their living situations stressful, 42% seriously considering suicide. What would a group like this, what would it have meant to you when you came out? Well, it would have meant a whole lot. I think I would have even been encouraged to come out sooner than 21. How come? Just to know that you have that support behind you and that, like, no matter who walks away from you, because I had a lot of people walk away from me when I came out. Dan's group turning strangers into family, members setting extra seats at their Christmas dinner tables, sharing life advice, and providing a safe haven for those who may need it. Tracy Dealman found that support in Amy Brinsfield, who drove four hours to attend her wedding, even making the bouquet. I don't really have family except my sister. Amy was basically the only one that was like, if you don't mind, I can come up to the wedding. Being able to see them in person and give them a hug and be there to support them on their special day was just amazing for me. Beyond the big days, the effort grew to form support systems. They totally helped me find a safe way 
to medically start transitioning. Foster Joy. I think right now I have 15 bonus kids. Come be a part of mine. I got plenty of room. And rediscover what it means to be loved. She came for Christmas. She came to our wedding. She's basically a daughter to me. Uh, she calls me dad. Proof that family really is forever, no matter where you find them. It has changed my life. It's shown me that there's so much good in the world where I really hadn't seen that before. And as we said, that group continues to grow. Their ultimate goal, to create an app where members can easily and securely make these life-changing connections. After the break, the man turning people's personal moments into forever songs. Stay with us. Welcome back. Oh, how we love to dance on this show. And this next story features an award-winning dancer and choreographer bringing the past and present together while moving her art form into the future. Take a look. According to Latasha Barnes, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. When I'm dancing, I feel the music, I feel the space. And she's keeping jazz dance alive with what she calls the jazz continuum. I honestly feel my elders, my ancestors, all of that comes through in an instant. She's creative, she's innovative with it. It's like seeing past, present, and future. It's, it's life, you see life when she dances. Growing up in a multi-generational home in Virginia, she credits her great-grandmother with introducing her to the Lindy Hop. She just picked me up and started moving me around and she called it the swing. She just said, this is our fast dancing, that's how we did it. The Lindy Hop itself is the partnered expression of jazz dance, an African-American social dance, noted to have started in Harlem in uh, the 1920s. Within the Lindy Hop also are many, many individual jazz dance styles. Dancers like the Charleston, the Breakaway, uh, Texas Tommy. Joining the military after high school, she rose the ranks and became a telecom and communication security specialist at the White House for the Obama administration. It was pretty amazing being a part of, of, of their, their White House um, experience. But it wasn't until a car accident in 2004 and the dance therapy that followed that Latasha started thinking about dance as a career. The focus on, on the muscle extension and contraction like really gave me back my dexterity. And yeah, that, that started the journey. A journey that led her to studying house and hip hop dance, eventually winning competitions. But she felt a desire to learn more. It really was the, the passing or the transitioning of my great grandmother that really pushed me to learning more about jazz. You know, she mentioned that she went up to New York to go dance at a fancy ballroom with some of her friends, the Savoy or somebody something. It's like the Savoy ballroom. Great grandma, that's where you went. Known as the world's finest ballroom, the Savoy was a legendary Harlem dance hall that showcased some of the greatest jazz musicians of their time. Dancers from the Savoy were featured in films like Hell's a Poppin', which featured the Lindy Hop. Reconnecting with the Lindy Hop just led to this synergy with Bobby White, who was an international level instructor in, in Lindy Hop. We would spend hours and hours playing around with steps and dancing. It was through the course of that commitment that, you know, I, I went to the International Lindy Hop Championships. 
And from there, a scholarship brought Latasha to an unlikely place to further her studies. In the woods of Sweden, in a place called Herang, which is still, still so confounding to me that I needed to go to Sweden to get this immersive experience in this inherently black dance. Seeing how many international celebrants there were of this tradition and culture really had me in a disjointed and discombobulated place. I felt like a guest in, in my own culture. And it was weird because if it had not been for what we understand now to be appropriation in some respects, that space would not have existed for me to even go and have that immersive experience. So I was really happy to be proven wrong <laughs> in, some of my, in some of the biases that I carried because of how they were wanting to uphold the dance, not just the art forms that they could make a profit from, that that wasn't their focus, um, because it's happening in the hip hop and house dance worlds also, and all of black dance forms, honestly. I fully recognize that there, there had to be another way to talk about this. That's where cultural surrogacy uh, came from for me. Yes, the Wendy Hub is for everyone. Always acknowledge and respect where it comes from. And in that same spirit, the dance aims to move forward in that way, to be a collective space for everyone to come to a place of understanding and celebration together. And by moving the Lindy Hop forward, its elders have put their trust in Latasha. Elders like Harlem historian Lana Turner. This incredible dance started right here. I know. I am calling you the tradition bearer. You actually have the ear and the minds of young people. You are able to bridge a number of forms of dance, as did the Lindy Hoppers at its time. As the assistant professor of dance at Arizona State University, Latasha now teaches a new generation of dancers. I'm so honored to be able to work with the youth there and to be a part of, of their journeys. You can learn dance anywhere nowadays. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you can research the history. This is connected to this step, which is connected to this music, which is connected to this community, which is connected to this step that preceded it, and so on and so forth. Latasha's mission of connecting dance and history continues through her work with the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund and the Jazz Continuum. Dance is in very good hand, especially with Latasha Barnes. Having first experienced this in my own family with my great grandmother, I, I just I know that she's intensely proud. I hope that all of my ancestors continue to be proud of, of the work that I'm doing in their name and in the name of our future ancestors. Next up, have you ever connected to the lyrics of a song as if it could have been written just for you? Well, what if your story could be turned into a song? Meet Mike Long, who's creating ballads for everyday people. NBC's Scotty Schwartz has this story. I think we know how this story begins. In a tiny basement studio in Portland, Oregon, there's something special about the lyrics floating in the air. They are still strangers at this point. This modern day bard is writing ballads about ordinary everyday people. Tiny anthems is a system where you give me information about your sister or your husband. I will then compose a song. And it all started with an offer to write a song about anyone for two bucks and quickly snowballed into Mike Long's life's work. Today, Mike charges about $300 per song, putting more than 20 hours each into the composition. There's just like something absurd about what I'm doing that just makes me want to keep doing it. Devs a grain and crystal when Sid comes sailing in. He's now written and composed hundreds of tiny anthems, each created for an audience of one. I've never experienced a gift like that before. For Dev Sirk and Sid Snyder, tiny anthems has become the soundtrack of their lives. There are very few people in this world that have a love song written about them. That is so true, and we have three of them. And Mike's creative process can be as unpredictable as his lyrics. His orchestra, just about anything that makes a sound. And watching him create music from thin air is simply magical. Moments later, yet another sound ready to celebrate that indescribable essence that makes each one of us so unique. If you get close enough to a person, you'll find something to love about them. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Portland, Oregon. We're back with more stories to leave you feeling good after the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. It's been said that a little kindness can go a long way. So Hoda and Jenna decided to spread some around New York with small acts in hopes of making a big difference. Today is gonna be an awesome day. I can't wait. We have a plan. Okay, what is it? Our plan is we are going to go up to random New Yorkers and show them random acts of kindness. I can't wait. Anybody, Let's we'll just walk it. up. Hug strangers. They may not like it, but we're in. Who cares? Let's That's go. This is up. It's dawn in New York City. Intrepid New Yorkers are heading to work. It's time to spread the love. New Yorkers love their coffee, and we're going to provide as many as possible. Free cups! First stop, Xenon's oh, Coffee Cart yes. on 6th Avenue. Okay, what do you want? Large. Large? No sugar, How much please? is it? 150 Not today. <laughs> Awesome. What do you get every morning? A muffin. Today it's free. Come on up. Are you so wondering why we're doing this? I'm on a show. No, we're just a random act. Can we put a smile on your face? Yeah, that's <laughs> what we were hoping to do. After caffeinating most of Midtown, we head east. We're going to pay for some people's commutes to work. Yes, we got, look how many, look. Bye. Here you go. Enjoy the bus ride. Enjoy, Enjoy your free commute. round trip ticket. Enjoy. Have a good day at work. Hey, baby! Hey! Do you want a free ride home right from here. work? Awesome. Happy day! High five! Yay. Happy day! I just moved here to New York. You did? Yeah. did you yeah. this, by the way, this is what happens every single day in New York. <laughs> and by the way, I'm I blown people, away. You New Yorkers are way nicer than in San Francisco. Right? So. Well, uh, I don't know that, but there's nice people everywhere. Get a hug? <laughs> Yay! Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank don't you, you love a Thank free thing? Have a good day. Who needs a round tripper? Happy day. Have a wonderful one. Lean in. Bye, everybody. It's time to head north to Our Lady Queen of Angels School in Harlem. Here we are. Our kindness tour has brought us here. Next stop, some cute kids. Come on. We're, We're here. here. Raise your hand if you like to read. Who wants their own cool book? Oh. Who wants to be happy? Because I'm happy. Happy to take home a book of their very own. Thank you, sweet oh, girl. Oh, you made my oh, day. What is happening? Let's get a group hug. hug. Get over here. Group get hug. over here. This is the biggest hug oh. we've ever had. Say cheddar cheese. The biggest hugs, the sweetest smiles from new friends. Finally, New York Presbyterian Hospital. This could be my favorite part of the day. Oh. We're gonna go and give thanks to some people who do some really great work. Can't wait. I can't either. Lunch is set up in a secret location as nurses in the pediatric unit gather for what they think is a staff meeting. Jenna and I wanted to come and say thank you thank because you guys, so you guys work so hard all the time. And so for the nurses here today, there is such a thing as a free lunch. That's we wish good. it was, you get a car, you get a car, you <laughs> but instead you get a sandwich, you, you get, get a sandwich. sandwich. Thank y'all for everything like, you did. On. I just can't believe how nice it is. Oh. Oh. I'm gonna do the biggest selfie you've ever yeah. seen. Okay. As if our day couldn't get any better, just as we were leaving. Do we have good news? In walks 18-year-old patient Gianluca Morola. I'm cancer free. Yeah. <laughs> Mom, the only person who's probably happier, happier than him is, is you. Oh, I'm happy for your family. Love wow. y'all. He couldn't wait to share his surprise with the nurses he says were like family. Oh, you didn't hear? It's amazing. <laughs> It is without a doubt the most precious gift of all. Even a small act of kindness can make someone's day. So let's all try to do something kind today. And our next story, Patricia Gallagher. She also is known as the flower lady and she is doing just that. She's spreading the love one bouquet at a time. On any given day, 68-year-old Patricia Gallagher's car will have many additional passengers. While this may not get her in the HOV lane, it does bring smiles to everyone she meets. Since 2013, Patricia has been collecting discarded flowers and delivering them to deserving people. Hi, I'm Patricia and I'm the flower lady. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
This started when my daughter gave me the idea. She explained to me that grocery stores, flowers, funeral homes have flowers that they would normally just throw away at the end of the day. And if someone comes along and they ask if they can rescue them, the stores are more than willing to give the flowers because the stores won't have to pay a company to take the waste away. Well, every flower should have a second chance to make someone happy. Oh, hi, this is Patricia Gallagher with the Happy Flower Day Project. I'm here to pick up the flower shares. And with that, Patricia created the Happy Flower Day Project. Happy Flower Day. I do the Happy Flower Day Project about five days a week. Even in the mornings, that store might say, I only have 13 flowers for you. I just sort of hear a little message in my ear. Yeah, Trish, there may only be 13 flowers, but just think of the 13 people that you're going to surprise this morning. I do ask God, where should I take these flowers today? That's really my personal flowery GPS. On most days, my little white car is filled. And on the days that I can't fit the flowers in, I just say to myself, okay, this is trip number one. I can easily drive 150 miles because I just can't bear to waste a flower. When I started this project, my car was brand new. It probably had 10 miles on it. Now it has 168,000 miles. We're gonna need one more car. One more car. <laughs> okay, woo. Look at this, all these petals, it looks like a wedding. Seeing Trish come in and, and brighten their day really makes them feel like people care, that people uh, haven't forgotten about them, and it just really helps them throughout their day and throughout their stay here. Hi, Eileen. Hi, Hi Matt. Hi, Hannah. The flower lady's here. Oh, hey, a flower do brighten my day. Yes, there's nothing more than the smell of the, wet, smell of the uh, flowers and the colors of them. It's tremendous. This is a good world. It's like we're not strangers. Everybody is a friend when you're giving them flowers. Speedy delivery! Look at the faces of the residents. I mean, you can't help but smile when you see flowers. They're just so beautiful. Thank you so much. We have a birthday girl over here. Happy Hi. birthday! They speak a universal language of caring. It's not uh, been a good day. It's so. not a good day. Well, this is, this is just what I needed. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll be in my thoughts and prayers. <laughs> I'm a guest. It means so much. You just never know what a person's going through. Trisha, I want you to know that I truly appreciate what you do, and this was a big deal for me today. Thank you. Okay, have a good day. I hope there's a ton of copycats, and I hope that she really brings awareness to things that are so simple, yet so meaningful. My hopes for tomorrow is that I always remain healthy and energetic, with a free spirit, and that I can continue doing these flowers for the rest of my life. What a creative way to spread kindness and make someone smile. And we hope our final video will leave you with a smile. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one final video for you today, sure to bring a smile to your face. 
A four-year-old boy named Sawyer has a genetic disorder. It causes hearing loss in children, but he recently underwent a cochlear implant surgery, and the cameras were rolling when he got to hear his family's voices for the very first time. Take a look. Okay, now I'm turning it off. Hi. 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 Yeah. Oh, oh, sweetie, he just lights up. Parents, weird. siblings, everybody there. She says that is the biggest Mama. smile. Mom says the biggest smile she's ever seen. Way to go, Sawyer. Can you imagine me, that. his mother, and hearing that? Yeah. Oh, time. Oh, that was beautiful. a good yeah. one. What a perfect way to wrap up our show. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember to spread some kindness and positivity today. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's fun-filled episode of Popstar Plus. It was a very busy week for celebs here in Studio 1A, and we are here to break down just some of the highlights of it. Girl Power was out in full force this week as our buddy Pink took over Studio 1A in honor of her new album, her ninth. It's called Trust Fall. It's fantastic. We'll tell you more about that. Also, Mariska Hargitay spilled the beans on all things you want to know about Law & Order SVU. Hey, the guys showed up too. Jabari Banks teased what to expect from Bel Air season two. And Jonathan Majors came by to talk about his upcoming roles in Creed, which I'm dying to see, and Ant-Man. He's a very busy guy. We have a jam-packed show, so let's get right to it. So when Pink stops by, it's guaranteed that she's going to get the party started. From songs like So What to Raise Your Glass, Pink has taken the charts by storm for over two decades, all while staying very true to her unique identity. Well, she's back with her latest album, her ninth. It's called Trust Fall. And she Pinkified Studio 1A in honor of her new music. Take a look. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you believe you haven't been here since 2012? No, and I'm usually outside, right? I know. And she just said, look at us. We're all grown up. We are so grown what up. What happened we have to nice us? Chairs and <laughs> thanks to you. Flowers. Uh, I know. It's just for you. How does it feel to be in this moment and have this record out? You said this is uh, the best one you've ever done? I mean, uh, maybe. I think one of them. For sh Yes, I do. I think yeah. that. Um, it feels crazy that it's nine. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's, I'm in New York with my kids and it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. I feel really good. What I feel the best about is the, is having a platform where people can just talk right to you yeah. and tell you what's resonating with them. Mm. And that lyric out there, Turbulence, almost made me cry. I'll tell you what, that's my favorite song cry. off the record. Turbulence. And I was going to ask you about it, but I saw, met Becca <clears throat> out there who survived cancer, and she referenced yeah. Turbulence. Turbulence is a track off the record yep. that, for me, for somebody who's dealt with mental health issues, I heard that song for the first time, and you have that whole lyric about, you're alive, that means you're committed to survive. Mm. Yep. You know, the panic may be temporary, but I'm permanent. I mean, yep. what has the reaction been to that song in particular? Everybody gets it, and that kind of makes me sad and happy all at the same time. Um, it's sort of, I don't, I hate telling people what a song is about, because it's whatever it's about for you, but for me, it's just sort of speaking to anxiety and almost walking my daughter through it down that road. And my favorite line is, even when you say you can't, I will watch you dance through this turbulence. Mm. Right. Yeah. It was a turbulent time that you wrote this record. Yeah. The, the pandemic. Yep. You and your family both really sick yep. for a time. And yep. you lost your father, who yeah. meant so much to you. Yeah. He was such a big part of he you doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got to live out his dream. <laughs> Tell everybody about Jim Moore, your dad. It was a vet. Jimbo. I mean, this was a... It was awesome growing up as his daughter, because growing up as the daughter of a veteran is... It's just so... To see grown men hug and cry, and we were doing car washes every weekend, and every Thanksgiving was feeding women and children from shelters and homeless and and they would have three-day campouts every year called lz friendship and uh, you know free-range kids these kids today <laughs> they don't know about that kind of stuff but i was like the beer runner um i remember having low and brow ones okay we don't need to get into that <laughs> it's all coming back to you it's now. going in a different direction Actually, we have a, someone wanted to send you, a, a friend of your dad's wanted to send oh, you a fellow veteran. Oh, you guys are veteran. trying to kill me well, this morning. Well, let's just roll it. 
Hi, Alicia. It's Aww. Tom, your dad's veteran brother. Tom Frame. We all love and miss him. Yeah. And congratulations on your new album. Aw. I love when I get there. Aww. He would be so proud of you. Mm. Love you. I love you, too. That's your dad's guitar in that, I think yep. they told me. Yep. Did he write I've Seen the Rain in that? It's a song your dad wrote in He did. He wrote that. Uh, I grew up with Tom Frame. It's so crazy. Mm. Um, God, he wrote that. He started it in Vietnam and uh, finished it after. And we put it on one of my albums, and he got to perform it with me in New York. And he could finger pick. He could mm. play the guitar. He was in a quartet in the Air Force. Right. He was the... He was that voice. Oh, wow, the high yeah. range. Yeah. When I Get There is the first track on the record that's yeah. just so simple. Yeah. And it's about the idea. Is that so I would like a love letter to your dad? I think that's beautiful about it is its simplicity. And yeah. it's a love letter to my dad. And, I, you know, we lost our dear, dear friend, Patricia, who went as Trish, eight months later. So it's just, it's a nice idea to think, I hope you're there. Mm. You know, I hope you're somewhere awesome. Yeah. Well, you are going to tour. Yes. And... Are you going to do all those acrobatics? I sure am. Crazy lady crazy. that you always do. When you go and see Tina Turner, and she's 69 years old in Louboutins, running all around that stage, <laughs> sounding better than you ever have and dancing harder, you have no excuse. <laughs> I'm going to be 90 in a tutu, <laughs> Tinkerbell flying through the air. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? It's so much fun. So two, a couple tours. Do something this summer, and then Trust Fall start in yep. the fall. Yep. A yep. bunch of North American stadiums for that. Yeah. You Are the kids going to come you with? Take the kids out? You know, absolutely. Yeah. Willow has a job on tour. We just had to go over minimum wage. And <laughs> it's different state to state. And she, I said, you know, it's about twenty two fifty a show, depending on uh, how long I go. If I run over. And she goes, I'll, I'll take 20. It's easier math. I'm like, that's not how you negotiate for yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you'll take 25. <laughs> so it's easier math. Exactly. There you, you go. Get Jameson to negotiate for her. I bet Jameson's he'd get a like, good deal. I just want a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love you, kid. Uh, well, we're so happy to have you here. The, the record's really great. We should have more time to talk really about Thank it. You. It's, your, it's your best work. Gotta love our buddy Pink. So good. If you get a chance to check her out in concert, too, do that. You can stream Trust Fall now wherever you get your music. It's fantastic. Now to another rock star, none other than Olivia Benson herself. That's Mariska Hargitay, the star of Law & Order SVU. Stop by Studio 1A to catch us up on everything we need to know about the current season. You know what I read this morning? That Olivia Benson is the longest running character in television history. That's it's, incredible. It's crazy. I'm still downloading all of it. I mean, wh why do you think it has such staying power? People love this show. I think that it is a smart show, a respectful show, deals with such um, tender issues that so many people deal with, and uh, it deals with them respectfully and honoring, and everyone wants to be seen, and I think the culture is ready to look at something and deal with something that they uh, historically haven't been ready to deal with, and I think the setup of the show with Olivia being the maternal figure and Elliot being, you know, the paternal figure, did I say maternal and paternal figure, I think was sort of the perfect archetype in that um, um, victims could come forward and feel safe and seen and fought for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, um, in addition to being the longest running character, you're also an executive producer of the series yeah. and a director of the series. And we actually have a sneak peek of tonight's new episode. Let's, let's roll a clip. Mr. Humphreys, how you doing? I'm Captain Benson. I never forget a gorgeous face. <laughs> or an hourglass figure. Well, uh, the cafeteria downstairs may have just added a few extra minutes to it. I'm sorry. You direct oh, this episode, I... it's an, and it's an unusual one. It's not, you, you, you took some kind of artistic risks, didn't you, yeah. with some flashbacks. I don't want to give too much away, but. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'll say is that our uh, showrunner, David Graziano and Julie Martin, wrote one of the most beautiful episodes I think I've I've really ever read and it's a bit of a departure from what we usually do and there are a whole lot of surprises in it and I was so deeply honored because that they trusted me with this material and people will see why tonight it is different it is different and um, I have to say I was so 
excited and you know every time you direct I have such reverence and respect for the role of directing and I'm always terrified and yet this time because I hadn't directed in three years it was so fun to to see what I had learned just mm. from being on set for that long and then I got the good good fortune and the blessing and the privilege and and just the honor to work with um, Bradley Whitford oh yeah who is one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with and then also Nancy, Nancy Travis, Travis came yes. and and my co-stars came to play in such a beautiful way and um, Octavio you know one of the new characters on SVU tonight is so brilliant in this as is Ice-T and the new kids and I just love working with Peter Scanavino and there's such an effortlessness and um, it was one of the most uh, joyous, uh, creative mm. highlights of my time at SVU. I mean, it is. Truly. You bring so much to it now, I mm. mean, having played the character, but now bringing that other side behind yeah. the scenes. You mentioned Ice-T, or shall we say, I see. As we learned <laughs> that you called him because he, you spoke at his um, Hollywood star ceremony, the walk. Yes, 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 yes. Why that can't? I, why? What is that called? Why I'm having Hollywood, like a Hollywood scene. Walk of Fame? Thank you. I know and why. And it's so funny because I wasn't planning. You know, I'd written this beautiful speech, and I was like, "How am I going to honor him? How am I going to honor him? This, you know, titan in the business." And then that just came up because my relationship with him is so cozy. And what you said about him was beautiful. It was oh. a beautiful speech. But Icy is a very cute nickname. Well, I what call, does he call him Icy. <laughs> Marishki. <laughs> You know, we all have a lot of nicknames for each I other. I know. Oh, you're not going to tell me, are No, you? no, I'm not. Okay. But um, he, I'm the only one that's allowed to call him Icy. Oh. And so. I'm it, glad you told me that because if I tried it next oh, time don't, he's here. Oh, don't, no. don't, don't. Mm -hmm. Not good. He's actually the sweetest man alive. Oh. And I, the kindest and the most gentle. And, you know, Richard Belzer passed mm. and you also wrote a lovely tribute to him. And he was just, I mean, what a heart and soul part of the show for a long, long time. Yeah. What a heart and soul. That was, um, he was family. Yeah. And taught me um, so much about uh, taking risks and creativity and um, trust. And he brought so much joy to the set. And boy, did this man love children. He was, you know, this acerbic, quick-witted, brilliant <laughs> mind. And yet he would melt in the sight of a child. Oh. He was just such a beautiful um, and complex and... Uh, it was such a privilege to know him. Well, you are just so well spoken. I, I mean, like, if we speak at some. If I, if I please speak at my funeral, would you? Oh, okay. Is that too morbid? <laughs> no, no, I'd be honored. Okay, good. You're like, <laughs> this is taking a weird turn. Okay, before I let you go, I can't not. You know what ask I say you. about you? Hold what? on, I'm just gonna say it. What? Badass. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. I think you are such a badass, and I have such respect for you, and I want to say that. Oh my gosh. Yes, and you know when and why I think that. But so do a lot of people, oh. and the way you are and oh the way you carry yourself, I want I want to say that. You're so kind, and thank you. That's true. Now and I don't know what to do. To no one. Oh Whoa. my God! Yeah, it, that's right. That's right, my queen. All right, I was going to ask you about the uh, Benson me, tell and me. Stabler. Just all right, just tell us real quick. Do they do it or not? <laughs> oh, okay. I'll just tell you right yeah, now. Okay, she's not um, going to tell. All you need to know is Benson and Stabler. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Benson and Stabler love each other. Deeply. How deeply? <laughs> just, she just, just said that. No, there, there, it's right there. There it is. There it is. It's so deep. I know, and we love it. Yes. And we just love wondering. And you know, the show is going. probably only going to go another 23 years. Yeah. So I think we should just wait and see. Exactly. You got to keep the suspense. Yes. Keep it alive. Mariska, what a pleasure and oh. unexpected. You're such a sweetheart. Wow. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank I mean you for it. being here and being a your sister. I know that. Also, always great to hear from Mariska. NBC's Law & Order SVU airs Thursdays on NBC. And coming up, we're going to hear from Jabari Banks about the season two of Peacock's Bel Air.
Welcome back. After a very successful first season, Bel Air is back now for season two action. And this time around, Jabari Banks' character, Will, experiences quite the challenge when someone new enters his world, all while he navigates the ebbs and flows of life on the West Coast. Jabari was nice enough to swing by our third hour to give us the entire scoop. Take a look. So a little more than a year ago, our next guest made one of his first live TV appearances here on the third hour I just today. I remember, well, we were like, oh my I God, know, this we kid so is excited. a star. <laughs> it was just everything with his energy. Jabari Banks was just kicking off his career at the time as the star of Peacock's hit drama, Bel Air. It puts a groundbreaking spin on the classic, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Now Jabari is back for round two yes. of this season. He's going to try to smooth things over with Lisa. Watch okay. this. Hey, girl, hey. Hey. How's it going? Good. Um, you think we could find a second to talk about our situation? I just don't like how we've been avoiding the whole issue between us. Well, I've been trying to give you your space since you're going through a lot. But, um, yeah, an actual conversation would be cool. Cool. Jabari is back. Welcome back. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you guys Thanks for having me. Are you kidding? This Thank is you. great. First of all, this show was a staple in my house. <laughs> oh, so I wanted to be here Happy to hear that. Thank you. Happy Don't watch too here. much television. It's not good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I can't see now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, season one was a huge oh hit. Oh, my gosh. Tell us where season two picks up. Right. So season two picks up. Will is outside of the gates of Bel Air, and he's living with Jazz in South L.A., Right? And he's navigating, trying to find his freedom, and trying to reconnect mm. with his family. And so it's a whole journey for season two. Mm. I'm super excited for people to check it out. Cannot wait. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got all these great stars in it. I mean, you've got Saweetie in there. Uh, you got Tatiana Ali reprising her original role. Yeah. Uh, so, so what was it like having Tatiana back on the show? Oh, That's it was cool. so meta. It was so meta. It was yeah. almost surreal. Like, she yeah. was crying the whole time. Wow. Really? Because, you know, she grew up on The Fresh Prince yeah. of Bel-Air. Yeah. And so to see Akira Akbar, like, take on this role of Ashley, right, it was like, a, a mirror of sorts, and so it was mm -hmm. super surreal for her. But she was such a joy, such a sweetheart, and I can't wait for people to see I her. love it. I could yeah. write a paper about how amazing the season two is and what you guys have been able to do with the original concept of the show. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, speaking of the original class, Will Smith is an executive producer mm -hmm. um, of Bel Air, one of the executive producers, and I read that he gave you some good advice as you started season two. What oh, yeah. Say? For sure. Well, well, in, in, in between season one and season two, I kind of had a, a, a midlife crisis, a mid-season crisis. Okay. Mm -hmm. and in between season crisis, and so I was reading the book of The Alchemist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot of great talks um, just about life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I was allowed to apply that to the role for season two. Is it tough to approach season two when season one was, listen, drop the mic. Like, everybody's ready now. Yeah. Right. Or before we didn't know what to expect. Now right. we come, like... Exactly. Well, you know... It, it's, it's something about expectations. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so I kind of had to throw that out the window okay. and approach season two how we approach season one from such a pure, you know what I mean, yep. uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how we attacked That's it. good. Yeah. Um, are your parents watching right now? They are. They yeah. are. <laughs> I know. I, Hello. Your, your parents are, are huge in this whole yeah. experience you've been going through. It was your mm -hmm. dad we talked about when you were here the first time that actually told you there was a casting for this. Right. What do they think now going into season two and all your success? I mean, they're just over the moon. They're over yeah. the moon and I'm so happy that that um I could give them this opportunity to kind of experience all of their hard work mm -hmm. you know what I mean that they put into me so uh, it's a blessing yeah it is a blessing yeah. Jabari I wanted to ask you because last time you were here I saw that you said you know everybody asked where do you want to be in 10 years and you said oh, you wanted yeah. to have your own clothing line yeah. uh, you want to work on some music you wanted to open an amusement park yeah. <laughs> right. how are yeah. you doing on, on all that um, um I'm a little bit closer to the the first two okay. <laughs> right but I'm still working on that me and Al we're gonna have a meeting after this all right there you go I love it <laughs> The roller coaster is going to be slammed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We work on the Universal Studio lot, so I've been studying up and kind of just going. I love it. Do you call it the hey. roker coaster? <laughs> the roker coaster. Hey, <laughs> no, we're not with Jabari here. So, okay, so you talked about there's some folks you would like to play going forward, like in, in feature films. Anybody Ooh. come to mind? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would love to play uh, Sam Cooke. Oh, oh wow. I can see that. He has oh, a great yeah. body oh, look of work. At this. Look at I can see it. Yeah. yeah. I mean the music and the activism. Mm -hmm. uh, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? This is it. we you know, we know people around here. People listen, so maybe they'll we'll put that in the universe. Yeah. Look at that side by side. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. I about see it that? Well. You see oh, it? It's good yeah. stuff. Okay. <laughs> and bring me to the amusement park, please. Right, exactly. <laughs> Can't wait to see how season two unfolds. Bel Air is streaming now on Peacock. Coming up, we're gonna hear from Jonathan Majors about two of his upcoming projects.
we're back after rising through fame through his roles in The Harder They Fall and Lovecraft Country. Jonathan Majors is making his mark majorly. Last year, he even hosted Saturday Night Live alongside musical guest Taylor Swift, an event for the ages. Now he's back with his latest projects as he joins the Ant-Man and Creed franchises. Have you seen this yet? We all have. <laughs> he also recently graced the cover of Ebony Magazine, and we are so happy that he's here with us now. Jonathan Major! <laughs> Wait, you still look like that one. <laughs> that, 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 Hello, that, 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 how are you? Yeah. How are you? <laughs> Is it weird to walk past the cover of I you know. on a magazine? Right? Uh, <laughs> Not really. I'm like. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Especially when it's that big. What's up, Queen? Especially with roses and... Uh, yeah, it's deep. There you go. Um, uh, Welcome. We, yeah, we're so happy you're here. I, I, I sort of hope you don't watch this show because <laughs> Hoda and I have spent a lot of time drooling... Analyzing that cover. Analyzing <laughs> the, the cover of that magazine. Oh. Um, what, when somebody calls to ask you to do something like that, what do you do to get ready for it? What do I do? Uh, Nothing. Show up. Show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Just be nice. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, you have to do some extra crunches or anything, no, but you stay no, ready, it's, don't it's you? It's a lifestyle at oh, this point. Okay. You know, you just kind of just go after it and, and, you know, live healthy and, yeah, do your best. When this hit my Instagram feed, I thought maybe I was the first to see it, but clearly not because all of a sudden my phone was like, bzz, 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 bzz. <laughs> yeah. I have friends over at Ebony and they were like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you know when you were doing it that it was going to be this big of a groundswell? No, nothing wrong with causing a ruckus. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. By the I way, that. you say that there's nothing wrong with causing a ruckus. Is that sort of your motto for your career, too, or no? Yeah, I, I kind of keep it cool, and then there's a time for everything, you know, and sometimes it's time to just, you know, make some noise. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So it's time, sometimes it's time to make a ruckus, and I also read that you say sometimes it's good to have a little swagger. So I guess swagger is subjective, but well, I was but, just yeah. about to say, how do yeah. you teach swagger? Like I've got two boys, and I feel like sometimes, especially when you're in the middle school age, yeah. Yeah. it's an awkward phase. It's kind of hard. Did it's you deep. always feel that, or no? Steve, swagger is an interesting thing because uh, it can't really be taught, and it's not what you think it is. If you what? try to do what swaggy, you're gonna miss it. Ooh. You're gonna miss it. Swaggy is just behind swagger. You know what I mean? How do you teach it's that? Just, it, you will, so you can't teach you it. Can't you teach can't it. teach it. But now, yeah. w when, when you were... Because it's already there. It's part of who you are, It's like right? the force. It was yeah. there all along. It's within you. I yeah. No, yeah. but here's my question. When you were growing up, is it true that somebody said to you, you don't have it? Not even growing up. I was a grown man when they said that. <laughs> <laughs> and what, and so how do, you, father. Yeah. how do you listen to... Your, <laughs> you had a child. Yeah. How do you listen to yourself and know mm. that, like, who you are is enough and you don't need other people to define who you are to, to make you cool? You know, my mother told me that the whole time. Mm. I had a drama teacher said, you know, you are enough. But you get to a point where it's like you have no other choice. When the stakes get high enough, you got to pick a team, you know, and it's best to double down on yourself. You, you know, know what? I'm happy you're talking about that because I think a lot of people will see celebrities and they just assume you've always been this way, right? But this has been a journey. And now this is your season, my friend. We've got Creed. We love Michael B. Jordan. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to see both of y'all fight. Well, it's deep. Uh, uh, Mike and I, uh, Michael B. Jordan and I uh, have become close, close friends, and uh, the fight is real. Okay, well, we have to take a look, because this has been a very hard movie to get a screener for, but <laughs> we have a quick okay. clip from Creed 3. Take okay. a look. I was the best, though. Yeah, you were. I was, bro. But I never got a chance to prove that. Look, all I'm saying, bro, if, if Apollo Creed take a chance on some underdog. Why can't you? What? <laughs> Wait, so this is the first time you're seeing this? Yeah, my, yeah, I, I've not seen the movie. You what? know, and so that's the most of that clip I've ever seen. I Wait. mean, I know the scene, obviously, but I've never... Yeah. Why, now, why haven't y'all seen it yet? Because it's... Well, people have seen it. Yeah. You know, some folks have seen it, but I just... Do you not uh, want to look right now? I, I, I never really... I don't have that desire. Even when it's you out? You don't watch your, your no, own work. No, 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 no. I wouldn't look at the Ebony cover if I didn't <laughs> bang, you know, bang, my, bang my phone every eight minutes. So was it hard to train for this role? Listen, Michael B. Jordan is in, you know, it goes without saying. He's a man, yeah. Right. And so are you. So did you have to train? I mean, what did you have to do to get ready to step into that, that ring? First thing Mike said to me, or one of the first things he said was, I want two gladiators in the ring, mm -hmm. you know? And as we know, Mike also directed this film. Yeah. And so I take direction from my director, like gospel. Mm. And that means something because I'm a pastor. So you say it to me, I go, 
uh, okay, <laughs> you sure? You know, uh, and so we went for it, you know, and so uh, three a day workouts, training, living a boxing lifestyle, you know, for, I think I had that for a, a year and a half. Wow. You know? Yeah, to the point that my boxing coach said at one point, uh, yeah, let's, we gotta cut the cardio. Really? Like, like it's, t it's, it's getting too real, you know, like wow. let's cut the cardio, you know. So when you is the last time on. you had a piece of pizza? Oh, yesterday. Oh, Me and Mike okay. actually had a piece of pizza yesterday. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> So yeah, he's not re okay, he's so not he's refraining from he's back. Yeah, eating. Yeah. He's just yeah. working out. Okay, now, yeah. we, but so you just said your mom was a pastor, is that right? She is. She is a pastor. You are still right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, she and, is. And so you said that she was sort of always believed in you and saw something in yeah. you. Did you know you wanted to act from a really young age? Well, I've been acting a, a, a crazy fool, you know, my whole life. Well, now and, you get paid uh, for it. And now we get paid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it's always been my. Uh, even if, it was, even if it wasn't my ambition, in the times in which it wasn't my ambition, it was always my drive. Mm. I was always pulled towards it, um, always felt the need to do it. Um, and uh, stuck, it's the one thing that stuck with me. It's mm. probably the only thing in my life that has stuck with me outside of my kid. Looking forward to seeing Jonathan in his next upcoming flicks. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania is out now, and Creed 3 will come out on March 3rd. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us today. From Pink to Jabari and everywhere in between, that was a lot of fun. It was quite the week here in Studio 1A. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time right here on Popstar Plus. Let's talk about the fact that it's Superfood Friday. So you're going to see what we did. Uh, today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer cooking up a cozy dish to beat the cold weather. It's taco soup. Hey, hey Joy. Let's talk about it. Okay, so let's, let's get step. What's a, let's get started. What's the first step? It was kind of like chili with a twist. Yes, I love this so much. I hope you guys are going to love it. So uh, basically what we're doing is we're taking the beloved taco mm -hmm. and we're transforming it into a slurpable soup with all of those wonderful Tex-Mex flavors that we love and we crave. And the best part is it comes together in about 30 minutes, maybe even less, oh. in one pot, which I can really appreciate oh, from the cleanup so afterwards. So how do we get started? Yeah. Okay, so here what I have is one pound of lean ground turkey meat that I added into the pot together with one diced onion. So you could cook these things together and just take a wooden spoon and as it cooks, you're gonna chop it up. It takes about seven to nine minutes. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the onion is gonna infuse a lot of flavor into the meat, but I love the fact that you can cook them together. And for people that don't want turkey meat, you can swap in beef. You can even swap in cooked about two or three cups of lentils. Oh. So you can make it vegetarian, you could really make it your own. So now we basically just build the soup. So all of those things that we love in tacos, I'm having 
adding in two cans of rinsed drained black beans. So you know now we're adding a lot of plant-based protein mm -hmm. and fiber. I'm also adding in for a pop of color and more fiber, a can of rinsed and drained corn. And then this is going to be two cups of, well, I'm already up to the taco seasoning, but I added in some quartered cherry or grape tomatoes. And you could, if you if you don't want to deal with slicing, you could always toss in a can of those um, diced fire roasted tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And I would say go ahead and throw the liquid in also because sure. it's only going to bolden up that broth. And now when it comes to the taco seasoning, you have two options. You could just go to the store, take the easy way out, yep. and add in whatever's on sale a taco seasoning go. packet. If you want to go that extra mile, I'm going to show everybody. I'll put it on today.com, and I'll mm -hmm. also show you on um, Instagram and Facebook how to make the easiest do-it-yourself taco seasoning blend. So it's just chili powder, cumin, salt, pepper. This is paprika. You can go sweet. You could go smoky. Garlic, onion powder, red pepper flakes, and oregano. And the cool thing about this is you know exactly what's in it, sure. and then you got a whole stash in your pantry. That's true. Yeah, and you can adjust the salt That's if salt. you want. Exactly. So speaking of salt, when it comes to the broth, so you mix all of this together, mm -hmm. and then you're going to add in four cups of a reduced sodium, either chicken broth, beef broth, or vegetable broth. And the reason I like to do a reduced sodium is because you can always add more in at the end, sure. but you can't take the sodium out. And so this, this is going on in there. And I just woo, mix mix this whole <laughs> thing up, and then it it was it was four cups, <laughs> and then you're gonna mix this thing up, and you just let it simmer. So one thing I will tell you is mm -hmm. I really like an intense Tex-Mex flavor. So what I would do is you put tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Al, I've never tried that, but this would probably go really well with a margarita. And now I add a second taco oh, seasoning wow. packet in there. Yeah. Oh, so everybody can good. adjust to their own taste buds. And Boy, I'm going to bring you over to my... <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Come with me over to my island, and we're right. going to add some special toppings. This is always my, my favorite part is the camera switch. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Ta -da! Ta -da! <laughs> Thank you. So so here I have it in the bowl. You can see how gorgeous so this is. So it's kind is. of cooked down a bit. Yes. And it, honestly, Al, it only takes about five minutes to simmer the whole thing. Look how mm -hmm. action-packed this is. Can you, can you is. put I mean, together? Can you put one together real quickly, Joy? Yes. So here I have with my ladle. I'm going to spoon it in here. And like uh -huh. you said earlier, you really are combining the flavors of a taco together with a chili. It's a uh -huh. little, it's soupier than a chili. Uh -huh. Now, I'm going to add on some Mexican cheese, yep. I have some avocado, oh, yeah. I have some jalapenos. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the spice, take the seeds out of the jalapenos for sure. And here's okay. one and last thing you can do. And then do you crumble the taco, the taco shells Here we go. There I'm going to make a little go. bit of a All mess. Right. Ian's going to cringe. <laughs> ah, there you go. Look at the muscles like steel. Joy, it's always good to see you. Thanks Thank so you, much. Joy. Perfect Thanks, for this Joy. weekend. Uh, love you guys. We love you mm. too. For more recipes like this, head to today.com slash food. We can always count on Today Nutritionist and our pal, Joy Bauer, to whip up something healthy and delicious. Joy, a lot of people, we didn't get a real reset, so we're rest re resetting today. So what do you have for us today? I am so crazy excited to show you how to make this meal. I think it's going to be on repeat in both of your homes, and it's super kid-friendly. Okay. So this is a turkey bolognese. Mm. It's obviously it's healthified. It's packed with protein vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, but I'm telling you the best part, it is a one pot wonder. And I think you're gonna be amazed how easy this thing comes together. Okay, and you've so, decided to swap beef for turkey. Is that because it's a little leaner? Starting. That's what you're supposed to do? That's right. Yeah. So here, what this is a pound of lean ground turkey. And when you shop for it at the store, look for turkey that is between 90 and 94% lean, because it's still gonna be flavorful and juicy. If you get up to the 99% lean, it's too dry. So between 90 mm, and 94%. 94. After this was already cooked, what I've done is I threw in, you can see here all the vegetables. I have diced celery, red bell pepper, onion, and carrots. And I saute it with the meat. Ah. But because I want to save a little bit of time, because I'm going to nail this thing before we close the spot. Okay. <laughs> I pre-sauteed all of the yummy vegetables. And now we basically have a nutrition party in this pot. Okay. We now take... 
This is a 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes. Oh, wow. One cup of broth, whatever you have in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take another easy way out. And instead of dealing with separate seasonings, I have here just five teaspoons of Italian seasoning. So this adds mm, oregano mm -hmm. and basil and thyme. Yeah. And then I'm stir this whole thing up. I'm going to put it on the stove, let it cook for about 25 minutes covered. Can I ask, uncover it. Can I ask one question, Joy, shift. just to be clear? Yeah. So the turkey was already cooked, and you, uh, if you were just starting from scratch, you'd put in the raw turkey and all the veggies at together the at the same time and saute. No, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. No, so first what I do is I, in stages, I cook the ground turkey first, By and itself. it takes about six minutes, right? And I'm just sort of chopping it up. When the ground turkey is cooked and there's no more pink, then I throw in the veggies. Oh. We're building, and it's another six to eight minutes. Okay. And then you you throw Ooh, in everything else that. and look at this. That looks like a sloppy and joe. So, <laughs> mm. so, you know, it's interesting that you say that, Hoda, because I actually like to put it on toasted English muffins Ooh. or in soft, like, Portuguese buns. Oh, my goodness. So now I'm going to take this pasta. Now, yes, what is you this can pasta? Eat whole yeah. This is a whole grain pasta. Yeah. And for people that are sensitive to cutting back on carbs, you can use zoodles, which are zucchini noodles, or you can also do spaghetti squash. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, I have over here some parm because you guys know everything's better with a little oh, bit of yeah. parm. Oh, oh, yeah. Look at that. Mm -hmm. By is the way, this amazing? I've seen some chickpea, like some other kind of flour pasta. Are those better for you? That's what this is, actually. Oh. So I said it was a whole grain, but if you opened up my cabinet, I have true whole grain, which is just 100% whole wheat. But I also have so many different brands of, like, chickpea or bean or lentil pasta. I would suggest people experiment around. It has a little bit more protein, and it has a little bit more fiber. It really depends mm. on what you prefer in terms of your taste. One other thing I'm going to do as soon as we... Um, shut down the segment yeah. i'm going to try to make a bolognese burrito i'll yes. let you know how it works out i'm and going to put it in a wrap yes, with a yes. Lot of cheese we love on a it bolognese then... burrito yes. Joy. Yes. Joy. we miss you we miss you um, it's good to see you though to get this recipe head to today.com slash food mm -hmm. delicious It is Cheat Day Friday, and today nutritionist Joy Bauer is putting her spin on a crispy chicken sandwich. Mm. Take it away, Guys, Joy. I am <laughs> so jazzed about this copycat chicken sandwich. It mimics the famed fast food version that we love, but for fewer calories, less fat, and more protein and fiber. It is the ultimate winner winner chicken dinner. We start with two skinless breasts, and I sandwich it between either parchment paper or wax paper, and we're gonna pound them thin. We want the width to be no wider than about half an inch. And I love that you get a mini workout too. Now I have two gigantic pieces of chicken breast. And I'm gonna slice these pieces in half because we're gonna make four servings. 
Next, you can take a bag or a bowl and place your chicken pieces right inside. And we're gonna marinate it with something surprising. One cup of pickle juice. That's right, we're using pickle juice. Now, your chicken is not gonna taste like pickle juice, but the pickle juice is going to tenderize it and it's gonna make it nice and juicy. Then you're gonna pop this in the fridge and let it marinate from 30 minutes until overnight. And now we're gonna set up our two-step dredging bowls. So here I have two tablespoons of mayonnaise and I'm gonna mix that with one egg. It's almost making like a glue. Okay, and now for the yummy breading. I'm starting with one cup of breadcrumbs, but you can also use flour. And to season them up, I have garlic powder, onion powder, paprika, a little bit of salt and pepper. Whisk this up. You wanna make sure all of your seasonings are evenly distributed. Take each piece of chicken and shake off the excess pickle juice and dunk it in the egg mayo mixture, get it nice and coated, shake off the excess, and then douse it in all of the breadcrumbs. You really wanna pat it down and then place it right on your baking sheet. I missed the top with a little oil spray, and then I like to sprinkle a bit of kosher salt right over the top. Now I'll place them in the oven, set at 450 on the middle rack for about 20 minutes. And while the chicken is cooking, we're gonna make the sauce. So we're starting with a quarter cup of light mayonnaise, adding in two tablespoons of your favorite barbecue sauce, a tablespoon of yellow mustard, and one teaspoon of lemon juice. Just gonna mix this up. If you do like it a little bit sweeter, you can go ahead and you can add in honey. And here is our crispy chicken. And now we're going to build our sandwich. I'm starting with pickles, lettuce, tomatoes, our chicken, look at that piece. And of course, our special creamy, dreamy tangy sauce. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness, this is a chicken sandwich. And you didn't even have to leave the house. Mm, looks really good. Yes. All right, for these recipes and more, you can head to today.com slash food. We are chasing away the winter chill with two warm and cozy recipes. Today nutritionist Joy Bowers here, joining us with a corn chowder and a spiced chai tea. Mm, good let's morning, start cooking. Joy. Good morning. Oh, my people. Hey, guys. So today is all about warming the bones with okay. healthy foods and beverages. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're going to make is, like you mentioned, a cozy, creamy corn chowder. And I'm telling you, this is scrumptiously slurpable. Mm. I'm going to take you over to my stove. Okay. So here um, I have what I'm calling my nutrition confetti. All I've done is I sauteed some carrots, celery, and onions. It kind of looks like confetti, doesn't Carrot, it? Celery, onions. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and now we build the soup. It's as easy as that. Because corn is not in season, I'm taking advantage of canned corn actually for a few reasons. One is because I get to use it. You notice I didn't drain it. The juice, I, yeah. I'm using the flavorful broth that normally oh. we just discard. Mm -hmm. I'm putting two cans in there. Then I'm putting in a full um, four cups of either a vegetable broth or a chicken broth. What did and you use there? I would, I'm using, uh, this is a chicken broth and I'm using a reduced sodium because I'm controlling mm -hmm. the salt. Okay. So there we have that. And then just a little bit of cayenne because it really does give it a pop of flavor. Okay. And then last, one pound of small red potatoes. I leave the skin on for extra fiber and um, I cut them up into bite-sized pieces right. because I'm gonna put a lid on this. I'm gonna simmer it for about 15 minutes just until those potatoes get fork tender. Okay. I'm gonna put this over here 
And then the fun begins. I want a lot of body in this soup. So I use an immersion blender, but you can also do this in um, small batches in either a food processor or a regular blender and see what I'm doing there. I'm just blending it so they get a lot of richness and body within that soup. And if anybody doesn't have a blender or an immersion blender, you can leave it chunky. It's totally Mm -hmm. okay. So now, yeah. It's really good. You could stop right there, but we're not going to stop. So then to finish it off, more texture, I'm Mm -hmm. adding in drained corn. So this time it's two cans of drained Mm -hmm. corn. Because I saw all these whole corn kernels in there. I was wondering when they Yes. And before I actually pureed the whole thing, Mm -hmm. I like to reserve some of the potatoes, again, for a little bit of texture and Mm -hmm. like surprises as you slurp through. It's really good. And a dash of salt. And it makes a great big batch. And I like to Very garnish simple. it with Isn't a little really bit terrific? of dill. It's really good, Joy. How about the tea, Joy? Yeah, we'll try that. that. The chai tea. This is fantastic. The chai tea. So here we go. I mm. put four cups of water in here. I love chai because my kitchen smells so unbelievably right now. It really infuses it with such aroma. And in the four cups of water, my combination is some cinnamon sticks, ginger, a little bit of nutmeg, fennel, peppercorns, cloves, oh. and cardamom. Okay. And I give you a recipe for a balanced base, but really you could ramp up any of these spices if you like a stronger flavor. And so a- as those were um, uh, simmering in here for about 15 minutes, then you put in your tea. So I have four tea bags that I added in. They've been in here for just about five minutes. Mm-hmm. Stick this over here. And now we build it. I add in three to four cups of a milk. Truth be told, I tried this with an almond milk, and it came out a little bit too thin, so I'm yeah. using a 2% reduced fat. Okay. And Maybe an oat a milk. Little I was going to ask you about oat milk, yeah. Oat milk would be fabulous. And this is a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of honey. And then I'm going to bring mm. you over mm. to my finished product. Come back with me over okay. here. I'm and sure it smells good, here, yeah. You can't I oh, strain it through a colander, mm-hmm. and here's the cool part. I feel like if you're going to be putting in so much effort, because it's much more involved than just steeping regular tea, mm-hmm. I make a great big batch, and then I stash it in the fridge, and whenever a craving calls, mm-hmm. I just warm it in the microwave, Very and you nice. have about seven cups. All right, Joy. Well, thank you much. We're, we are ready for the weekend. I know, thank cozy. You. Yummy, we yummy, yummy. It. Thank you, Joy. And for uh, more bye-bye, of these guys. Recipes, have a great weekend. You, you too. too. Head to today.com slash food. Now I'm ready for a nap.
And we've got today nutritionist Joy Bauer here with a sweet and savory uh, take on the classic. Joy, good to see you. Good morning. Hey, guys. Today's forecast is cloudy with a huge chance of mouth-watering meatballs. And now I've been waiting to say that to you my entire life. Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> so let's get started. What, do we, what goes into this? So the meatballs are very standard. I'm starting with lean ground turkey meat, and I'm adding just simple stuff, an egg, a little bit of panko, and everyday seasonings, some garlic powder, some onion powder. I put in a little bit of smoky paprika because we love that in my house, mm -hmm. salt and pepper. And then you just mix this up. Again, the name of the game is a quick mix because you don't want your meatballs to get tough. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to form them into 20 to 24, I would say light and fluffy golf ball size. And if your batter gets a little bit sticky and fussy, mm -hmm. put it into the fridge or the freezer for about 15 minutes. It will firm and stiffen it up and it makes it much easier to work with. Mm -hmm. Then you just cook them in the skillet. I would say two minutes on each side undisturbed because you want to sear that outside, get it nicely browned. And then I just sort of toss them around to get all of the sides browned for five to seven minutes. Mm. But while they're cooking, I'm going to show you what really makes this recipe sing because mm. it's all about the sauce. We're making a mustard maple sauce. Oh. So here I have a little bit of light. Let me, let me, let me make sure you guys can see this. There you go. Okay. So I have some light mayo and that's going to add the creaminess. But now I'm adding Dijon mustard, okay. and the Dijon gives it a tangy zing. Because it's called mustard maple, I do have our maple syrup as a sweetener. Mm -hmm. And if anybody prefers, you can do um, honey as well. And you mix this and emulsify it until it's nice and smooth. The key is not to add the broth until everything comes together because otherwise the mayo will get a little bit clumpy mm. then you you add in your broth mm -hmm. and i'm going to take you over to the stove because i have one that's done let's okay. see if ian could flip this camera guys <laughs> I've oh, nice. Nice. Here I am. <laughs> so here are my meatballs and these are all complete and i take my my sauce over here mm -hmm. And I pour it in. Mm. Now you have two options. You just simmer this for about, I would say, 10 minutes. And if you want it nice and sort of smooth and thin, it's done. If you want it a little bit thicker, let me show you this one over yeah, here. Oh, what did you do? I added a slurry the last minute. So it was just um, one tablespoon of cornstarch mixed with a little bit of water. And mm. I mean, this, this is really thick. And then That's, what would you I, serve that with, Joy? Back over to my island, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So this is where we take it home. Now, oh, there's a wow. few different ways that you could serve it. This is standard right over penne. Sure. And for mm -hmm. this one, I, I kept it nice and thin. Yeah. These are pa pass arounds. Oh, you could put, you know, nice. as apps. Yeah. And then the but last is a sandwich. sandwich. That is Yum. fantastic. I am. This is a meatball grilled cheese. And Yum. guys, I'm going to put this on great. Instagram. I'm obsessing over this one. Wow, that's that looks beautiful. Great. Joy, thank, thank you, you so Joy. much. Those are perfect. I love that. Going to try that this weekend. Mm -hmm. For this recipe and so much more, head to today.com slash food.
today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is putting a spin on two easy comfort food recipes. Take a look. Hey guys, today we're making scrumptious wholesome recipes using a muffin tin. First up is a mac and cheese butternut squash. So here I've roasted butternut squash cubes in the oven at 400 for about 25 minutes to get them super soft. And I just take a fork and I mash them so they're the consistency of mashed potatoes. And we're gonna start our indulgent cheese sauce. I'm adding one cup of low-fat milk, half a teaspoon onion powder, quarter teaspoon of dry mustard, and an eighth of a teaspoon of paprika. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And now you have the option to add a few drops of your favorite hot sauce. Bring this to a gentle simmer. My milk is starting to gently bubble. Turn off the heat and I'm gonna add two cups of 2% sharp cheddar. Mix it so all the cheese melts throughout. We've got all of this luscious whipped butternut squash and I'm gonna mix it right in the pot. And one tablespoon of softened butter. And now I'm adding my sauce right into my pasta. One thing, it's important to cook the pasta, your elbows, al dente because remember it's gonna cook again in the oven. I'm adding in one large beaten egg. Now we take our muffin tin and I'm gonna take half cup scoops to fill my compartments. I'm gonna top them with a little grated Parmesan cheese. And they go in the oven at 350 for about 20 minutes. I let these sit and firm for about five, 10 minutes. Pop them out with a knife or a spoon. I mean, good for you mac and cheese that you can eat with your hands. And now we're making three ingredient candy bars that'll really hit the sweet spot. Chocolate peanut butter crunch cups. Two cups of semi-sweet or dark chocolate chips. Two cups of crispy rice cereal, although you can use any high fiber whole grain cereal. And a quarter cup of a creamy nut butter. I'm using peanut butter. So first I'm going to melt the chocolate, either using a double boiler or in the microwave. Now I'm just adding in quarter cup of my creamy peanut butter using semi-sweet or dark chocolate chips will provide flavanols, which helps to keep our arteries healthy, our heart, our brain healthy. Now I'm just adding in my brown rice cereal. You can see this is like a crispy puffed brown rice cereal and mix until all of the cereal is coated. And we are ready for our muffin tin and distribute the chocolatey, peanut buttery goodness. I just wet my fingers so they don't stick to the chocolate and I press down to firm the shape. And just one more thing, you can sprinkle some coarse sea salt or kosher salt right over the top. Then I stash these in the fridge to firm up for about 30 minutes. As you can see, <laughs> I've already dug into two. Guys, I love this recipe so much. It's totally indulgent, perfectly portion control. You just pop them right out of the compartment. I mean, come on, you definitely want a bite of that. Mm. I and do, we can actually. eat the whole thing? I know, when you see us leaning forward <laughs> as if that's gonna help. One Listen. day we'll get food again, I, I know. For these recipes and more, just head to today.com slash food. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to The Boost. I'm Al Roker, in for Hoda today. And over the next half hour, we hope to boost your day with a few stories that leave you feeling inspired, including some frosty fun. What do the names Blizzo, No More Mr. Ice Guy, and You're a Blizzard, Harry, have in common? Well, we're going to tell you a little bit later in the broadcast. But first, we spotlight the power of social media and one man's mission to spread kindness online. Tom Yamas has more on viral videos that are literally moving people to tears. Find a veteran and give them $1,000 to help their Christmas dreams come true? You're a veteran. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for serving. Thank you. His videos are unlike anything on social media. What do you want most for Christmas this year? Yeah, impossible. Really, what? My wife just passed away. $500. That's for you, sir. 
transforming people's lives with a handful of cash and a whole lot of kindness. His name is Jimmy Kellogg, but online, he's known as Jimmy Darts. Seeing if someone could no. buy this ham. A man on a mission to spread a little love with what he calls undercover kindness. Came to the store today to see who would be the kindest person to help me out with Thanksgiving dinner. Oh. And so I actually don't need it. I have a gift for you. No, no, you Yes, keep it. I have a gift for you, man. No. I got $500 for you. Don't give me $500. Yes, it's for you. You're amazing. Every morning I wake up and I uh, put a live stream on and you know 500 or 1,000 people hop on and uh, literally the money just comes in like crazy. I'll hit $1,000 or 500 in like 10 minutes. And that's when the fun begins. Find a mom with kids and ask her to buy you a notebook and if she does give her $1,000. His videos have gained a loyal following, more than 5 million fans on TikTok alone. So all of your videos kind of have the same formula. It starts with uh, moral test. You yeah, know, you ask yeah. people to be kind. Why did you decide to do it that way? I think it's just a great way to find people that like are prime for a blessing. You know, the first video I did helping someone was I was actually in Miami walking on the beach and there was this uh, homeless gentleman living on a tent there. And I said, you want to be best friends for the day? What happened next was a day full of fun and the beginning of an opportunity for two new friends. Your boy Jimmy oh, walked yeah. up and, he, and, and blessed me with an opportunity of a lifetime. So I put his cash app at the end of the video and in 24 hours, like over $30,000 was sent to him. So it just changed his life. So I was like, wow, there's a strong community of people out there that want to help. And if you just give them the opportunity, they will. Since that video, Jimmy says he has gifted more than $100,000. Donations ranging from a few hundred bucks to brand new cars. You completely transparent with all, where all the money goes? Yeah, so basically all the donations, that's the cool thing. They send the money and that day they get to see who it went to, you know? The 26-year-old says all the brand partnerships now pay the bills, which allows him to continue blessing strangers in what he says is the beginning of a bigger calling. My dream is to start a church in Los Angeles, and it's called House Party Church. No drugs, no alcohol, but you come. There's a DJ, water slide for baptisms. What do you say to people who are like, this kid's completely nuts? Oh, I say, well, you're probably right. <laughs> you know, I don't got nothing to say to that, really. You know, I just like having fun. Until then, <laughs> he's hoping his message online can help ignite a trend of giving. It pays off to be generous, doesn't it? It does. Be wow. nice, be kind, and love one another. Love will conquer all, always. We're making like generosity cool in a sense because genero you, you can never go broke by giving. I would just say that to anyone watching. You can't go broke by giving. Love someone, and you'll be amazed at what happens. Turning from one social media star to another, using TikTok for good, fighting for inclusion, and spreading joy, one video at a time. I pride myself in being positive and searching for joy wherever I can, and regardless of what life throws at me, I want to roll with it. College student Maya Paul calls herself an accidental activist. Take me back to your childhood and what you were like as a kid. Growing up, I was a wild child. I was full of energy, super rambunctious. I would literally run laps around the house. It was sophomore year in college for you that things started to take a turn, is that right? I was living off of chips and Pop-Tarts and getting two hours of sleep, so when I was feeling weak and tired, I was like, mm, I'm just an irresponsible college student. No big deal, but the weakness and fatigue continued to get worse until it reached a point where I was collapsing, walking back from my classes. After being diagnosed with a genetic condition and a probable neurological disorder, Maya became wheelchair bound and began to notice how difficult it was to get around. It's unfortunate because oftentimes people's only exposure to disability is when they become disabled or someone close to them does. And now I just have to clear a space for me to sit. So I just hook the chairs with my own chair. I want you to explain to someone who may not know, who may have the best of intentions, what does it feel like to be in a wheelchair and not have resources or to feel invisible? To know that there is a world out there that chooses to exclude you, that chooses to not make the necessary changes to create systems that can support you is soul crushing. To know that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be looking at tens of thousands of dollars extra for anything that I want is frustrating, soul crushing, and heartbreaking, especially when I know it doesn't have to be this way.
So Maya decided to join TikTok and try to raise money for an emotional support animal. And I posted my first dance video. People were like, oh my God, you're moving your leg, you're faking your disability. And then I realized that I could bring awareness to the issues that I wish I had known before I became disabled. Everywhere I go, I come across countless access barriers. Today, Maya has more than 420,000 followers. Her username? I'm a roll with it. Along with TikTok dances, she posts informative videos to educate people about everything from her daily life to injustices faced by the disabled community. What is the positive response that you've seen? It tells me that the world is ready for change. I'm not sure if you can see it, but on my door, there is the thing that makes your door close a bit more slowly. A lot of them are really tight, which makes the door extremely heavy, which reduces access for people with strength issues, with pain issues like arthritis or wheelchair users. And so I made a post talking about how there's an adjustable setting and I received hundreds of comments like, I'm going to work tomorrow and I'm going to check on it. So it's really exciting to see people who are going back and making actual accessible changes. What do you want people watching this story to understand about people who are living with a disability? Disability is not a bad word. Nobody is guaranteed ableness. You can become disabled at any point in time without any warning. So it's better for everyone to make better systems to support disability. Maya hopes to change minds, hearts, and even policies, and of course, to continue to dance. I didn't dance in my wheelchair for over a year. I had days where I felt like my body just wouldn't let me, and I learned it doesn't matter. I got to dance every single day. Next up, Savannah Sellers introducing us to an artist whose subway sketches have earned him millions of followers. This is my favorite thing to do. I always said if I could draw portraits, for the rest of my life, I'd be happy. Growing up in the South Bronx and raised by his grandmother, Devon Rodriguez always knew he wanted to be an artist. Tell me how a kid from the South Bronx decides, I want to do art. So I've always been into art my whole entire life. Ever since I was like four years old, I just loved to draw. Then when I got to middle school, I was doing graffiti, but I wanted to draw realistic. So as a teenager, Devon turned to painting portraits. Portraits are so intimate. How did you decide that that's what you really like to paint? This guy named James Harrington, who was painting his student, it looked so real, and I got into his class, and he taught us about oil painting, and so we'd always be, like, drawing people, and it, he just inspired me so much that, like, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do forever. Year after year, Devon worked hard to perfect his craft, practicing by drawing strangers in a place that was familiar to him, the New York City subway. I would just take pictures of people, not ask them or anything, and then just do a full-on oil painting at home. But it wasn't until last year, in the middle of the pandemic, when Devon began posting his subway sketches on social media, that people took notice. What made you think, I'm gonna get in the TikTok game? So, during quarantine, everybody was locked up <laughs> in their homes and bored, and well, I was on Instagram, and I was seeing these young kids that were going viral and like, living like this big life. So then when I saw TikTok, I was like, okay, maybe this could be the way. I'm gonna go back to the subway and do sketches. People are wearing their masks now, and let's see how that goes. What makes you decide that you're gonna sketch someone? So I try to get like a whole variety of people, like every background, every age group. It's kind of random. Does anyone ever look at you like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you looking at me? Actually all the time, but you know, <laughs> then I'll start to explain to them. And then they're like, oh, really? Like. Okay, okay, draw me. Excuse me, miss. Miss, I did this drawing of you. Devon's drawings went viral. His first post racked up nearly 5 million views. Then his next one, 17 million. Oh my God, no way! <laughs> People would message me like, oh my God, like I watch your videos and it helps me get through my anxiety and depression and they just make me smile. I never thought it would lead to that. With all his newfound popularity, there's one person who still keeps the 25-year-old artist grounded. What does grandma think now? She's like, you're doing something right, but she doesn't fully understand like yeah. social media and like her friends from church are always like, oh, my grandson loves your grandson. She's like, of my grandson? Like, he doesn't even clean his room. Like, <laughs> how is he, how does he have these fans? Today, with 19 million followers and counting, Devon is now the most followed artist on TikTok. You're a real artist, but then you're also a social media star. Yeah. How did the two kind of meet for you? I think I got lucky. I didn't like get a lot of attention as a kid, so I just think it pushed me to like, okay, how am I gonna get out there and try everything at my disposal and finally something worked.
really well. Before we said goodbye, I just had to ask Devon. Can you guess me? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Did you miss? I drew you. <laughs> oh my gosh! You are so talented! That's amazing! Ahead on the boost, how this coffee company is making a difference with baristas as strong as the coffee they serve. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. Change is brewing at 1951 Coffee, where co-founder and CEO Doug Hewitt is serving up second chances for refugees in need. Check it out. Coffee is, is something that does connect us all together in so many different ways. Behind the counters at this cafe in Berkeley, California, there are baristas, strong and bold, as the coffee they serve all of them from different countries who fled to the U.S. in search of refuge. It's one of the things that, that makes the coffee industry such a special place for working with refugees is that coffee is simultaneously perceived as, as very American. Um, you know, every person walks through a cafe as a part of their, their daily lives, while at the same time, it's one of the most international things that we have here. Coffee isn't the only item on the menu. The 1951 Coffee Company is also a nonprofit and a coffee roasting business with a purpose, aiming to train and create jobs for newly arrived refugees and asylum seekers. Can I get it for you? Doug Hewitt is the co-founder, the man behind the idea, whose passion for helping refugees started back in grad school when he heard the story of a co-worker's journey to the U.S. We're here. What is it about you that you wanted to help refugees? Uh, it's a great question. So when I actually was working as a barista back in 2007, actually, uh, there was a person who was hired to work alongside of me who I at the time did not know was a refugee to the United States. He was from Eritrea in East Africa and told me his story of making his way across the Sahara Desert, across the Mediterranean Sea. I realized that this is a, a, a place that I wanted to work in, to work with refugees and um, kind of be able to provide a, a better welcome um, for people after that long journey. By 2012, Doug had a business plan to blend his love for coffee and help the community one cup at a time. How did you get the idea for this coffee shop? I realized that there, there needed to be a company that would understand the, the challenges that refugees face and, and learning English, adapting to a new culture, uh, and then securing that first kind of survival job here in the U.S. With donations, his coffee dreams brewed. Alongside the cafe was a free intensive two-week program that not only introduced those newly arrived to an espresso machine, but to opportunities to practice their English and even learn tangible career skills. You train them, but you also want to help them secure that job. So, um, you know, once someone goes through our training program, um, we have opportunities for work at our cafe. Um, but when there are more graduates than we have jobs, um, we work with a network of over 40 different cafes here in the Bay Area. To date, the coffee company program has successfully helped train and place more than 250 people from 29 different countries. Among them, Evelyn Solis. 
The 21-year-old who sought asylum in the U.S. just four years ago says the coffee smells like home back home in Guatemala. I feel like in love when I when I enter to a cafe, like see my coworkers again, talk with them, interacting with people, customers per, all day, making drinks. I don't know, just being the cafe, I feel like I'm in, in a good place. Evelyn has been with the cafe for two years and has been promoted to lead barista. She's also hoping to one day grow beans of her own. Now I have my my plans to make my own business in the future. As for Doug, his goal to help others rebuild their lives from the ground up is not just a tall order. I think that's that's really what we want to provide is for people to have this opportunity to not just work, but to be able to like have ownership over their own their own lives and their own path here in the U.S. Doug isn't the only one finding creative ways to give back. Meet 10-year-old Hollis Schneider. Through her art, she's changing the world and the lives of other kids, proving you're never too young to make a difference. When I was four years old, I read a book called Fancy Nancy Aspiring Artist. And it's this book about this little girl whose friend goes away and she's absolutely devastated. She's encouraged to do some art. At the end of the summer, she decides to have an art show in her backyard. What a splendid idea. And at the same time at our church, we were finding out about the James Project. Our mission is to support foster families and those who are wanting to become foster families through providing housing, parental support, child's provisions, and a community of supporters. I remember thinking, they don't actually have parents who can take care of it. That's awful. They don't have beds. That's awful. I have to help this. She came home one evening and was telling us about that and was a little bit distraught. We decided maybe we can combine what we read in Fancy Nancy and this need. That's where we had an art show like Fancy Nancy did to raise money for the James Project to actually help kids. She worked for days and days, a little four-year-old creating as much art as we could. I think that first year we made around $200, which was way more than we were expecting. Hollis was able to buy not one, but two beds, and she did not stop there. The next year, she started to ask if she could have another art show. I had one last year, and it seems like a lot of people did it. Came, I mean, hope to see you there. <laughs> I think we raised around $250 that time. We, I had creative juice, but it was, it was actually orange soda. And then the next time, when she was six, we created even more art. And I think that year we made around a thousand. It's now turned into this six, seven years later. This year, the James Project will officially host the annual event now called Artsy, an art fair for kids in care. After hearing Hollis's story, Fancy Nancy illustrator Robin Priest Glasser even donated unique pieces to the cause. And of course, Hollis will be there to teach other children how to create their own masterpieces. And I had no idea that this would be this big. Hollis has raised over $7,000 for the James Project, and that is the equivalent of almost 50 beds for foster kids. The money that Hollis has raised has been so impactful. A bed got uh, given to one of our families, and uh, the child just got so excited about this bed that was their own that they piled all of their own clothes and toys and everything onto their bed. The ownership that it gives to a child that this is mine and I get to I get to put everything that I own on it. I think that you get to play any part in providing aid or help or even comfort. I mean, that's enough to make you get choked up. I hope Hollis just sees the ripple effects of, of what she's done for us, that she does inspire people to go out and to do something for the community. Hollis, I can't even tell you what it means to be your mom, to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I just hope that you're able to see the impact that you have on so many. And Hollis has a simple message for anyone wanting to help. If you dream big, then that could actually happen. Well, hold on to your dreams. Don't let them go because they could become reality. After the break, we're going to hit the slopes with a brotherhood of skiers, building bonds and inspiring America. Plus, we reveal what those names Blizzo, No More Mr. Ice Guy, and You're a Blizzard, Harry, have in common right after this.
next, we're taking a look at a legacy on the slopes 50 years in the making. The National Brotherhood of Skiers advocates for greater representation in winter sports. Steve Patterson has our story. Watching a troop of talented young skiers shred up the slopes of Vail is a thing of beauty. Realizing they're all black is a vision. It's super fun. But this is still a rare sight. This past ski season, the National Ski Areas Association says that 89% of visitors to U.S. ski areas identify as white. A problem Ben Finley and Art Clay set out to solve half a century ago, starting the National Brotherhood of Skiers to advocate for greater representation in winter sports and dispel the idea that black people don't ski. We are skiers who happen to be black. People sometimes get us confused. Well, you two black people who happen to ski. No, we are skiers who happen to be black. Every year, they bring thousands of black skiers together. What we tried to do was make it all a party. You know, just, hey, while well, well, we out here partying, why don't you try some of these skis? <laughs> and it worked. It's a brotherhood, yeah. sisterhood, yeah. it's all good. Groups from Denver to Detroit. This is wonderful, we love it. Even as far away as London. We ski, we ski high. Their goals are growing. They hope to see black athletes on Olympic podiums. 20-year-old freestyle skier Keegan Seppel is the dream. What's it like to just like fly through the air like that? It looks crazy. I mean, it's, it's one of the best things ever. It's the most freedom you'll ever feel. He's one of several NBS-sponsored athletes with U.S. team ambitions and talent. I didn't really have any role models growing up. Now he's surrounded by them, proof that finding serenity on the slopes has never been skin deep. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Vail, Colorado. From the slopes of Colorado to snowy Minnesota to reveal the connection between Blizzo, No More Mr. Ice Guy, and You're a Blizzard, Harry. They're just three of the snowplows named by the folks of Minnesota, all thanks to a pun-packed tradition created by the state's Department of Transportation. Here's NBC's Maggie Vespa. In a state synonymous with brutal winters, plows double as proof of Minnesota's comedy chops. How popular did you think this was going to be? Not anywhere near as popular as it became. In 2020, the state's Department of Transportation hoped to thaw the icy isolation of COVID lockdowns with a contest, letting the public name snow plows. 122,000 votes later, a pun-packed tradition was born. Producing pop culture plays like The Big Laplowski and Control Salt Delete, celebrity nods like Scoop Dog and Betty Whiteout, and in pure Minnesota fashion, Ope just gonna plow right past you. Perhaps the gold standard manned by David Jackson. You are the driver of Plowy McPlowface. Yep. yep. Plowy's namesake, a British vessel online voters famously dubbed Bodie McBoatface in 2016. People see it and they're like, oh, it's Plowy. <laughs> Jackson sees the silliness as gratitude. I think they get a better appreciation for what we do. This year's winners honoring entertainment royalty with Better Call Salt, You're a Blizzard Harry. You're a wizard Harry. And Blizzo, the Grammy winner blown away. To know that there is a snowplow named Blizzo makes my heart melt. A warmth voters deem unavoidable. How can you live in a place so cold and not have a good sense of humor? Maggie Vespa, NBC News, St. Paul, Minnesota. When we come back, the latest viral video to put a smile on your face. Stay with us.
We are back with the boost with one more video sure to make you smile. This one is sure to leave you with a smile as big as the one that you're about to see on this little boy. This red truck with balloons is about to deliver a life changing gift. It is the boy's first oh prosthetic God. leg. The doctor used that truck to put him at ease in this moment. And once the leg is in place, our little hero is up and he's ready to go. Oh. Tiny bit of hesitation, but look at this. He's off to the races, oh. taking his first steps. Look how happy he is. And oh. no, he is ready to go. Wow. How Didn't lovely is that? No. And how quickly he just started. Yeah. Oh. Amazing. Mm. Kids are amazing. Shout Doctors out to the doctor. Too. Exactly. Yes. I love that guy. And that is a perfect way to wrap up our show. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow with more of The Boost on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Hello there, welcome to Health and Wellness Today. I'm Craig Melvin. February is American Heart Month, meaning there's no better time to get your heart health and your overall wellness back on track. And that's what we'll do today on the show. So let's get started. First up, an eye opening look at new health concerns over those popular gel manicures and the lamps used to dry the polish. NBC senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn looked into the potential risks and how to stay safe at the nail salon. The color of choice at your next nail appointment may be cautionary yellow. A new study pointing the finger at UV lamps used to dry and cure gel nail polish. Researchers at UC San Diego and the University of Pittsburgh finding UVA light from dryers can damage DNA and cause mutations in human cells, potentially increasing the risk of skin cancer. Alarming results for the estimated 3 million Americans who visit nail salons each day. The industry bringing in more than $10 billion a year in the U.S. alone. Some regular gel manicure clients expressing their concern about the potential risk of nail dryers on social media. And I'm feeling really anxious about the damage I probably caused my hands. Hello. Dr. Chris Adigan, a dermatologist in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, explains gel polish won't solidify without this light. She says even dryers with LED bulbs emit some UVA rays. What do people need to know about putting their fingers into those UV lights? That radiation of UVA causes damage to the skin cells and that causes premature aging the skin and increases our risk of skin cancer. How much of that UVA exposure that's needed from these nail lamps that we have yet to discover. Adigan says more research is needed, but in the meantime, she says you don't have to scratch gel nails from your beauty routine. Just try to limit your UVA exposure. What is the best way to protect yourself if you want a gel manicure? I recommend patients use a UPF factor fabric or any kind of sun protective fabric to cover their hands. So wear a glove with the fingertips cut off? That's right. <laughs> kind of like bring back Madonna style. That's right. The American Academy of Dermatology also recommends applying a broad-spectrum water-resistant sunscreen with an SPF of 30 or higher. But Adigan says she prefers fabric over sunscreen. These sunscreens um, were tested based on our the UVA and UVB combination exposure from our sun. And the type of UVA exposure that is coming out of those lamps is very different than what's emitted from our sun. While the Food and Drug Administration considers UV dryers low risk when used as directed, some research shows certain lamps can emit UV radiation stronger than the sun. Skin cancer survivor Carolina Jasko believes nail dryers may have led to her diagnosis. When I was a senior in high school, I was diagnosed with melanoma. Jasko, who first shared her story with Today.com in 2019, says while at the nail salon, she noticed a black vertical line similar to these 
under one of her thumbnails. That's an early sign of melanoma. A malformed nail in the absence of trauma, that also needs to be evaluated for, by a dermatologist because that could be the early signs of a squamous cell carcinoma in the nail. When getting a manicure, Adigan says become a partner with your nail tech. Ask them to avoid pushing or cutting your cuticle because it helps protect your fingertips from inflammation and infection. Other tips to help keep you safe at the salon? Consider traditional nail polish instead of gel. Reserve gel for special occasions. And know the possible side effects of your medications. Some can increase your sensitivity to UV light. Advice to help you nail it when it comes to your health. So experts recommend taking a break from nail polish at least once every few months in order to, to see your natural nails and to inspect them for abnormalities like those dark vertical lines, redness, and inflammation. Well, now to a plastic surgery trend that's all over social media. You've probably seen this. It's for adults who want a more chiseled look. Once again, here's Vicki Wynn with that story. A plastic surgery trend with cheeky transformations. Oh, face reveal. So this is day 11 of my recovery and my swelling has basically all gone away. Those wanting a more chiseled look undergoing buckle fat removal. The cheek defining procedure taking over social media with even celebrities like Chrissy Teigen revealing their results. I did that Dr. Diamond buckle fat. Thing here. Sculpted faces reminiscent of the pose made famous here in Zoolander. Really, really, really ridiculously good looking. The craze becoming part of a post pandemic boom. 76% of plastic surgeons now seeing a growing demand for cosmetic procedures as face to face interactions resume, forcing many to leave those Zoom filters behind. The number of buckle fat removals increasing nearly 70% in 2021 when Americans spent more than $10 billion to go under the knife. What exactly is the procedure? There's a buckle fat pad, which is this fat pad right on the lower part of your cheeks right here. So if you look in the mirror and kind of suck in your cheeks like that, you're mm -hmm. sucking in that buckle fat pad. And so by removing it, you're creating the shadow underneath of the cheeks and giving more of a structured or sculptured look to the cheeks. Dr. David Schaefer, a board certified plastic surgeon, says buckle fat removal isn't new. He actually underwent the procedure himself about 10 years ago. I always had a problem. I had a full face. So I couldn't see my cheekbones and the jawline. Self-conscious about the fullness of her face, Paris Keswani, a jewelry designer in New York City, underwent buckle fat removal a year and a half ago. She says the surgery, which took less than an hour, gave her the contoured reflection she'd always wanted. You look in the mirror after the procedure, what did you think? You can see the results right away. And it gets better and better with time. Depending on where you live, buckle fat removal can cost five to seven thousand dollars. The procedure requires minimal downtime, but does cause some bruising and swelling. However, Dr. Schaefer explains if you don't have enough fat, you'll want to avoid the surgery, which delivers permanent results. As you age, your face does lose some of its fat. Mm -hmm. Long term, what do you look like after this procedure? As long as you're done conservatively, you're okay. If you overdo it and then you're losing all of the surrounding fat, you can get that gaunt or hollow kind of look. Dr. Schaefer recommends facial fillers, which can last up to two years as an alternative. He says he often uses fillers in combination with buckle fat removal to avoid going too far surgically. What if you gain weight? Does that fat come back to your cheeks? There's such a small amount of fat in there, gaining weight is not gonna make a difference. With complication rates between 8 and 18 percent, possible risks can include infection at the incision site, facial nerve and salivary duct injuries, numbness and asymmetry. When considering buckle fat removal, experts say choose a board certified plastic surgeon. Ask to see before and after pictures of previous patients and before following a trend, identify your why. Something Keswani says she knew from the start. When you look good, you feel good about yourself. It's all about self-love. Vicky Winforce there, Vic, thanks. Up next, Harry Smith's journey to find peace and relaxation through an ancient practice that's still being used today. And then later, the great Susan Lucci opening up about a cause that's near and dear to her heart. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Health and Wellness Today. When you think of meditation, you might picture yourself sitting in a, in a quiet room, perfectly still. But NBC's Harry Smith visited a place where people are finding peace and tranquility one step at a time. About an hour north of Phoenix, where the saguaro cactus are abundant, is the town of Carefree. It sounds like a place you'd go to check out for a while, or maybe check in with yourself. What's this thing? This is a very ancient symbol of how to come back to one's center. A labyrinth explains Veronica Lynn Clark at the Savannah Wellness Resort. It looks complex, just like mindfulness and all these other things, but it's a very simple pathway to the center. A destination often not easy to access. What if you're afraid of the center? What if you, like, uh, I don't know, the center's got a lot of stuff going on in there. I just, just as soon leave that door closed. A lot of people are afraid of it. Yeah. That's okay. Not everybody's going to want to go right to the center. There's a lot of stuff there. Wellness buzzwords, or is there a there here in the desert? Clark describes it as a kind of walking meditation which can be so much more gratifying even for someone who feel frustrated because they can't sit and meditate. Mm. So this is a very simple way to meditate. Labyrinths, or something like them, have been around for 4,000 years. The modern labyrinth movement started at San Francisco's Grace Cathedral in the 1990s. I was at the end of my rope, so to speak, with uh, the AIDS crisis, and I was just burnt out. After careful study and prayer, the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris thought walking a labyrinth could soothe a troubled soul. This pattern, if you can allow yourself to just drop in, then you get in touch with this whole other level. We tried it there in that sacred space. Maybe you don't quite get it the first time. It was different in Arizona. Part of that is the relaxing. Part of it is just letting go. This is such a beautiful way for people to practice that. The internal noise, often static, dissonant voices within began to quiet. The longer we're out here, yeah. the more I wanted to slow down. Mm. A lot of times people will confuse a labyrinth with a maze. Mm -hmm. The maze is intended to create some confusion. But this labyrinth, if you stay on the path, you're not gonna get lost. It's a metaphor, a journey. What do you think the labyrinth might be a pathway to? Inner peace. Since Lauren Artris brought the labyrinth to Grace Cathedral, thousands more have been built across the country. Many at churches, including at the Presbyterian Church on the Green in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Pastor Ruth Bowling and her husband Carlos built a full labyrinth during the pandemic. It has brought them and the community here a path to healing. Every experience is different. Every time I walk the labyrinth, it's a different experience for me, but it's always good. It's not that the labyrinth in and of itself created this experience. You allowed yourself to have the experience by walking through. You can still walk mindfully, peacefully, and still experience the peace inside of you. So it's portable. Yes. That was great, Harry. Thank you. Coming up, how to eat heart smart on a budget. And spoiler alert, chocolate is on the menu. And then a little bit later, we're gonna focus on our skin and busting some old cold weather myths. We'll be right back.
Well, we are back with more health and wellness today. Most of us want to eat right, but not always easy. The Cleveland Clinic recently released its annual national heart survey, and it found that nearly half of the people who responded say cost is the greatest barrier to eating healthy. Registered dietitian Vanessa Rosetto recently showed us how to do it without breaking the bank. This has been a misconception in a lot of communities for, I think, a long time. The idea that healthy has to be expensive, but you maintain not so. Not so. This is why dietitians exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of tips and tricks for you to be eating healthy. So, for example, people always think, you know, f vegetables and fruit are super expensive mm -hmm. and that you can only eat organic. Well, actually, you know, the dollar store has frozen fruits and vegetables for sale for one dollar. Wow. So if you want to have vegetables in your life and you are afraid or you don't have time or you know cost is a problem for you, yeah. you can go to the dollar store and you can get a bag of carrots or a frozen bag of berries. And to be clear, there's the same nutritional value in frozen fruits and vegetables that, as, as raw. That's right. And actually minimal processing. So they're allowed to ripen to peak and then flash frozen. So it's up for grabs. Okay. Yeah. Oatmeal bakes. Oh, that's what I do. I make these oatmeal bakes for my kids. I yeah. want them to eat oatmeal and I dump the frozen fruit in there and I bake it and they think I'm a genius. They add peanut butter. We've got fat. We've got protein. We've got fiber. We've got antioxidants. Yeah. And I'm a winner. And it's pretty simple. Yeah. All right, let's talk about, we've covered fruits, let's talk about veggies now. You've got a simple trick for veggies as well. So find the ones that you like. Yeah. My son only likes carrots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you get them in bulk on a Sunday. You cut them up. You put them in water in a glass container. Or for my kids, we just put them in Ziploc bags because they're grabbing yeah. and going. Yeah. That's, so buy in bulk is a secret. It's a secret, and they, you go through it pretty quick. And you also mentioned to buy non-starch veggies. Yeah, so non-starchy veggies help to keep you full. They he help your gut be healthy, which helps for immunity. It's winter, so people are getting more sick, so more vegetables help you be better for longer. And a few examples of non-starch veggies. Yeah, so carrots, celery, arugula, spinach. There's, again, one of the greatest misconceptions, perhaps, seafood, expensive. Well, it can be expensive if yeah. you're going to go to, you know, a fishmonger and you're going to buy $30 a pound halibut or, you know, salmon. But if you don't want to do that, and also people are a little bit weird about fish yes. as, um, as a leftover. Yeah. So buying them in bulk, you can get them at the regular grocer or you can get them at, you know, a Sam's or a Costco. And so now you're just getting one piece at a time. You can defrost before you leave the house, put it in the fridge. When you get home, it'll be ready olive oil, some Dijon mustard in the air fryer, and you had one perfect piece, so you're not wasting. And these are packed with omega-3s. Omega-3s is for your cardiovascular health, yeah. for your brain health, reduces the risk of cancer. A lot of recipes, of course, call for butter, the call for olive oil. How do we save there? So, I buy in bulk. You can get two to three pounds. I know that is, that is quite the large can. That's quite the large container of olive oil. Yes. You're right. Also, you know, you can get online just a container that will allow you to pour, perfectly like portion that out. So you could fill it up and then hide that so you don't have to look at it. It's about sixteen to twenty dollars depending okay. on the weight that you have. And remember, the serving size of olive oil, you know is still one tablespoon. So we know it has anti-inflammatory properties, but one tablespoon is sufficient. All right, let's talk about really quickly here, saving money on snacking as well. So I'm a dietitian, so snacking is oh, how snacking, I live snack. my life. This okay, is, good. I'm always thinking about the snacks that I'm having. Uh, I love to go to any kind of pharmacy to get the deal. So the two for one for the yeah, nuts or you. the chickpeas, fiber. I'm always looking for fiber and protein. But also, I will always die on the sword of chocolate, which is my favorite thing. I eat it every single day. It has fat. It has protein. And if you get over 85%, it also has fiber. Great tips there, Vanessa. Thank you. Well, now, it, it can be really hard to take care of your skin in this cold weather. My fellow Third Hour co-host and I recently spent some time with dermatologist Dr. Angela Lamb, and she busted some of the biggest winter skin myths. So when it comes to keeping our skin healthy during the dead of winter, what's, what's the one thing that you want us all to remember? I want everyone to remember moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. Okay. The moisture is so critical, and we're actually going to walk through some of the myths and the ways we can really tackle that winter skin. So okay. should we moisturize morning and night? Yes, twice a day is ideal, especially after the bath or shower. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So let's get to some of those myths. And the first one is you need to drink more water in the winter to prevent dehydration of your skin. Absolutely. That's a myth? Yes, that's actually a myth, because you need to drink water mm -hmm. year-round, mm -hmm. but the water we drink actually doesn't 
penetrate our skin very much. Oh. It's actually the water that comes in contact with our oh, skin and actually preventing the water from evaporating off of the skin surface. So you actually want to take baths, but moisturize after. Mm -hmm. And purchasing a humidifier increases the actual moisture in your environment. That's mm. really what you want to do. Okay. Baths. All right. A popular misconception, we were talking about this, that you need to oil up your skin, that winter skin needs oil. That's a myth. That's a myth. Oh. Because oil actually does not trap moisture. I have so many people that come to me and say, but I'm putting on this yeah. oil, and then within 15, 20 minutes, it's my skin is dry again. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. You need certain types of moisturizers, but not oil-based ones. So, so you what do want you use? ones that are actually emollients, so they draw water to the skin, mm -hmm. or something that's actually called a humectant that traps moisture. It prevents moisture from evaporating off the skin surface. Huh. Mm -hmm. And it should be thick? Yes, it should be thick. You shouldn't be able to see it. If you can hold it up to the light and see through it, oh. it's probably not thick enough for the winter. So an oil is not ideal. Can you give us an example of one? I know we don't like to name brands. Yes, but is there... yes, absolutely. So we have some um, ones, for example, like a CeraVe, mm -hmm. Cetaphil. People have heard of all of those. Okay. And especially mm -hmm. you want something that says cream. 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 Like cream. in a tub. Mm -hmm. Like you scoop absolutely. it out. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm doing that. it wrong for you. Yeah. I know, I know. So the next one, we talk about exfoliating in the winter. Mm -hmm. It says you that's a myth that you should exfoliate in the winter. I thought you should do it, you know, throughout the year. Yes. So exfoliation is really trying to get dead skin cells off. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do is just use a better moisturizer. So when okay. people are trying to get those skin cells off, they're actually not treating the root cause. The reason why your skin feels like it needs to be exfoliated more in the winter is because it's actually dry. It's dry. So you don't want to exfoliate. Mm -hmm. You want to put more moisturizer on. Okay. Let's yeah. talk about another myth here. Sunscreen. This, this yes. idea that in the winter you don't need as much. Mm -hmm. Not so, true? No, that is absolutely uh, not true. You need just as much sunscreen in the winter as you need in the other months. You guys just did a piece about sunscreen. Somebody yep. that's a you know a world-class skier so you know that look the snow is reflecting sun mm -hmm. to the face mm -hmm. you need to continue to use your sunscreen a broad spectrum at least SPF 30 and again all those winter sports so mm -hmm. skiing ice skating snowboarding you have to have that sunscreen on just not for couch surfing no I learned a lot yeah great, that's great. I learned I've been doing it wrong for 40 years uh, well thank that's you. not the thank only you. thing that's true there's always that's true. Time for change. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Lamb, thank you. Just ahead, another side of the queen of daytime drama, Susan Lucci, shares her personal mission to spread heart smarts. Don't go away. Welcome back. We all know Susan Lucci and that iconic role that she held for four decades, playing Erica Kane on All My Children. But you may not know, she is also an ambassador for the American Heart Association. Hoda and Jenna recently found out why that work is so very important to her.
You, first of all, you look fantastic. Thank you so much. And Great this, to see you both. I'm so happy you're here. This, is you. an this isn't just a cause, because sometimes there are causes and people will put attach their name. This is much, much more than that. You yourself have had some issues with your heart. I have, and it took me so by surprise because I had never had a health issue. But uh, four years ago, mm -hmm. I came very close to having a, a fatal heart attack. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it the widow maker. Mm -hmm. uh, I came really close because like so many of us as women, in, when we have any kind of symptoms, we say, oh, it'll go away. Yeah. We, we take care of our children, yeah. we take them right to the pediatrician, yes. but for ourselves, we're not on our own to-do list. Yeah. And I got so incredibly lucky in so many ways. What happened that ways. day? Uh, well, yeah. I'll, I'll try to cut it short, but yeah. a couple times that month, the month of October, I had had a, a very slight chest pain. Very slight. Yeah. And I thought it would go away. And it did. By the time my husband and I were seated at the table in the restaurant, yeah. it yeah, went away. Gone. Yeah. Happened again. But it was also radiating around my rib cage to my back. But I'm still saying it's nothing. nothing. It can't yeah. be anything. Yeah. Right. My mother's 104 years old. No, yeah. it's not me. You yeah. know, it can't be. In any case, um, three weeks went by. I could not ignore it any longer. I was out of it the kept boutique, happening. Yeah. shopping for a girlfriend's birthday present. And I had something I could not ignore. Yeah. And uh, I sat down to a that's what was going on. And I remembered an interview that a woman gave on TV many years before. I mm. don't even know why I remembered it. But she said that women's symptoms for a heart attack are often different than a man's. Mm. Yes. And she described this elephant pressing on her chest. Mm. Uh -huh. And that's what I was experiencing. Oh but I had such incredible good luck. I, as I said, I was in a boutique. The manager came over and asked me how I felt. I told her. Very calmly, she said, Susan, my car's right outside. Why don't I drive you to St. Francis? That's one of the premier heart right. hospitals mm -hmm. in this country. Such good luck. It was a mile right away. There. Exactly. Right there. So I had amazing good luck. The, the mm -hmm. cardiologist there is mm -hmm. spectacular. He is all what his reputation mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. he said, and I kept thinking in the car. I can't do this. Right. I have a day off. I have to do this. Right. I have yeah. to do you that. I have a whole Kinda list good. I have I to have do. I have a whole list yeah. I have yeah. to do. This is what we women do. Yeah. And you know, I love that you have that, that you have really spoken out about this because we know you're probably saving a life right now. Mm -hmm. I and hope and so. we just commented on your beautiful necklace. I can't stop staring at it. Oh, it's gorgeous. Tell us what a little bit about it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, a year ago, I had some symptoms again, mm -hmm. and I went right back to the same way I was, the mm -hmm. way I, I've been telling women for three years. Yeah. No, listen get to checked. your symptoms, yeah. get mm -hmm. checked out, know your numbers, and, and put yourself on your to-do list. Yeah. Well, I reverted right back. Yeah. I was not even, I was... You no. just thought, there's no way. There's oh, no, no way. way. Yeah. No way. Yeah. And I didn't even tell my husband. He then insisted, no, you have to Good call point. the doctor. It's 10 o'clock yeah. at night. That's the other thing. We don't want to bother the yeah. doctor. I know. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, I was thinking... I would love to create something that would be a concrete reminder to women that even if they have survived and been yeah. lucky like I have been, uh, to keep on mm -hmm. being vigilant mm -hmm. remind and yourself. remind yourself. It's like a talisman. Mm -hmm. You know, you can wear it up by itself. You can wear it layered. And the there's way, a little gold beautiful. heart beautiful. in it. It's, it's 14 karat gold and a half carat of diamonds. It's, it's sparkly. Gorgeous. We oh. like sparkly. Yes, we, we do. We see ourselves going, combing yeah. our hair. Oh, yeah, I have oh. to take care of my heart. And that's it for this episode of health and wellness today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Craig Melvin. We'll catch you next time on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Just ahead in this half hour, we're going to introduce you to... Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours.
This yeah. is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallholds, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's so like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallholds now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms called pins start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis. And so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. 
Small holds mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is a large like, third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas, and so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom-built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. We have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. So you roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off, pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. It, when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Because um, you can pull it like it's yeah, almost stringy. It. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. These are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and the nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
Smallhold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms, and I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school, and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world, and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? You, like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create, and this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking, but for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. They don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second. We're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Love sesame it. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah. gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would just a steak. Just like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop <laughs> it down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just take flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would do for I'm sorry, burger. do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. <laughs> so just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to, yep. want to encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, oh, and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Wait. Look it. Look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush <laughs> this on, almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh. Come on, baby. 
Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like meat, too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes, he doesn't need to okay. not Nothing's trying to, crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's mane steaks. It's meaty. Can we walk. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like mm -hmm. chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. It's mm. so good. Wait, this is, mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good, I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner to mushrooms, mm -hmm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm. in this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way. Yeah and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's mane steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want for meat, 
and then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom meal. I'm gonna you eat don't... it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It literally tastes like, I don't want to say nothing, because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know, is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right? When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce. Super porous, yeah. Soak up anything that you give it. So, best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh, yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready. All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning. Yeah and the caramelization around the edges. Like, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Get into it. I know, I know, sorry Tyler. I'm just like, I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken and even looking at the texture, I'm gonna pick it up and just show you. Oh my God, I just touched it for the first time too. It's like the, the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? That's <laughs> the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This is your first time, like yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken, literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? If I need another mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was gonna eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute, I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> that is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. Yes. I'm taking this home. This, wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians, like something weird is going on here. Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true meat fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yeah. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, truly. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. Good Monday morning, the week beginning with wild winter weather. Tens of millions being impacted from coast to coast. It's February 27th. This is today.